I'm going to say, I would just have probably have this part right here. This is going to be free. Yeah. I can't come in here and be like, what can I get?
Whoever has their phone or iPad on, make sure it is silent. We're ready, Mr. Sadler. All right.
You may be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good morning. I hope y'all had a good weekend. I apologize for the delay. We we're having a meeting with maintenance about the AC issues, and it's really bad news. They say we're not going to have AC for two months. So, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Any issues come up over the weekend that the court needs to be aware of from anybody? No? Fantastic. All right, Ms. Pittman, please call your next witness. Yes, Sharon, sure, I'm Steve ah. Paul, Nicole Bochin. Ms. Brown, thank you. Come on up, man. Good morning. You could approach the witness stand. Yes. You can please stop and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you out? Yes, I do. You may be seated. Thank you. Mr. Brown, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Good, thanks. How are you? Doing good. <laughs> What's your name? Nicole Beauchamp. And can you spell for the record? C O L E. And Beauchamp is B E A U C H A M P. Yes, ma'am. Uh, where are you from? Miami, Florida. You still live out there? Yes. Okay. So you're here just for this trial, is that right? Yes. Um, and uh, you born and raised out in Miami? Uh, no, born in New York. Okay. So how long have you live in Miami? Oof. Since uh, 1990. So quite a while then. Yes. Okay. Um, and um, what do you do for work? Um, I work for an airline. What kind of work do you do? Uh, sales, reservations, okay. international sales. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll kind of get into it, the reason that you're here. Uh, you know Charles Beltran. Yes. How do you know him? Um, I met him at a grocery store in Miami. In Miami? Yes. Okay. Do you remember about when? On January 2nd, 2021. And um, you said it was in the, the grocery store in Miami? Yes. How'd y'all meet? Um, um, I was grocery shopping, and you know, I saw him, he saw me, and um, he, approached, you know, he approached me, and he started talking to me, and telling me he's not from here, and I'm always intrigued by a foreigner, you know? So I was like, oh, you know, when he says he's not from here, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, you know, I want to show somebody around, I'm just a friendly like that, and that's how we met. Um, so pretty quick hit off um, in terms of able to talk and, and yes, issues. very um, very personable, uh, very intriguing, very charming. He had a mask on, so I couldn't see his his face, but his eyes were very um, very like welcoming. And we're talking about like the COVID style mask. Yes, COVID style mask. Yes. And um, I guess did you guys did you guys continued on seeing each other beyond that grocery store then? Um, at first, I didn't, I didn't meet up with him at first. I just don't meet up with guys like that, so it took a while, like probably like a week of him being like, oh, let's go out to eat, and I, you know, I was like, eh. but then um, I was like, you know what, he's like, it's, let's go out and have lunch, I'm like, okay, it's the daytime, we're going to go to a public place, so I, I went. Okay. Um, how was he? Awesome. He was very um, friendly, personable, easy to talk to. Um, we hung out every day after that. What did he tell you his name was at first? Antonio. Okay. And you believe that at first? Yeah. Well, you know what? No, I don't believe anything any guy says. <laughs> so um, I was like, "Yeah, right." You know, I did. I did think it was weird. I'm like, "Oh, so he just moved here?" He told me he had moved here from um, Pennsylvania, and I'm like, "It's just odd." I'm like, "You just moved here? Like, you don't know anyone here?" He's like, "No," and I'm like, mm. no, "That was odd to me." So I was ready, you know, an alert about that. But you still gave him a chance. I still gave him a chance because the way he approached me was very welcoming. Yes. Um, and then did you guys begin to do some lunch and dinners and things like that, or um, we, had, we had lunch that day. After that, we got together every day. We would just, but I would never went to his house. We would like meet up and hang out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, was it physical quickly or? No, we were friends at first. He didn't try anything. That's one of the reasons why I felt so comfortable hanging out with him. And this is why I don't ever meet up with any guys because they're too, um, you know, they try to come on to you quickly. But he was nothing like that. He didn't try anything at all. Um, eventually, we did, but it was because I gave him that okay, kind of. 
you know, body language. You know, okay, be okay. But at my first, no, we hung out for like a week and he didn't try anything, never. So he was patient and respectful and waiting for any kind of physical advances. Exactly, yes. And did your relationship kind of progress from there? Yes, uh, we were together every day and it was like intense. You know, he was very, very loving and affectionate. I'm not an affectionate person. <laughs> he, he was very um, loving and affectionate and we were together every day. Um, did you guys eventually you know, spend evenings at each other's houses or at that? Or? So yes, so um, he eventually was like, oh, you want to come to my house? Like I have no furniture there, but you know, and I was like, okay, you know, when I, he pulled up to his house, his house was right down the street from my house. He doesn't know though, but I was in shock of how close where he was at, you know, where he was staying at was. So I started um, going to his house. He was by himself there though. When I got to his house the first time, I remember I walked through the whole house. Like I went through every room. He was like, he was more like this girl's bold, you know, just walking around, like seeing who's in that house, you know? But yeah, it was just was us anyone, two. Was anyone home? It was just the two of you? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and now you're saying house, was it an apartment or a house? An apartment, okay. two bedroom apartment. Um, and so you, you walk in, you're like, I'm gonna check the whole yes. way out of this thing out. Exactly, okay. yeah. And how did things go from there? Um, from there, you know, sort of being intimate with each other, and we were just together every day. From there, it was awesome. It was great. So, how many times did you go over there when it was just the two of you? Every day. Okay. Was there a time where some other people showed up? One time, he was like, um, he called me. He's like, oh, um, you know, you can't come over. He's like, I was thinking I'd go to your house. I was like, no. I was like, I don't bring no guy to my house. You know, like, I have a son. I was like, no, I don't bring that men to my house. And he's like, um, no, my friends came back from out of town. You know, and I was like, he's like, yeah, I don't want nobody over here, you know. His friends came, they just showed up out of nowhere. I was like, okay, and that was that. We didn't see each other, or I never went to his house again for like a week. So you ended up not going at the right. first time. Okay. No. Was there a time that you did go over there when these friends were there? So then, um, one day he's like, oh, you know what, you can't come. He's like, you can come over, but you have to be quiet. I don't know. You're loud. He's like, talk loud, laugh. You know, he's like, you're loud. He's like, I don't know if you can be quiet. I'm like, I can. And he's like, you know, um, he's like, all right. So he picks me up and we get to the house. Now he came back after knowing what's going on, you know. I remember him picking me up and he was just very weird in the car. He didn't want to, when we pulled up to the house, he was like standing there, you know, looking down. Um, like a I don't know what he was thinking about before. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, um, he's like, no, no, come on, let's go. I remember him going up to the front door and he stayed there for a while, like listening before we went in, but we go into the house and um, I didn't see anybody when I went in there. We went straight to the room. Okay. And how did he act that visit in the, was it different the way he yes. acted in hindsight? Mm -hmm. He was um, just a little bit nervous or anxious the way he was acting. Okay. Would he do stuff um, like with you guys in the room? Yes, like he, the way he locked the door was different. He put like a table there. He also, um, where, he put, where I slept in the room, in the bed, was more against the wall, not next to the door. Things like that. Okay. And at the time, you didn't know anything that's going on? I had no idea. Okay. Did you ever find out uh, his real name? So what happened was... Um, and I guess, actually, before, let me, okay, before we get to that, let me ask more about that time. The, there were people there. You didn't see the, the people that were there, though? No, I didn't. But the next day, I used to leave every morning. So the next morning, when I wake up to leave, um, I walk out. I was like, oh, gosh, the walk of shame. <laughs> I was like, oh. so I walk out, and um, I see two women. I saw um, this white woman, and then I saw another one who had black hair, like curly hair. I saw her hair. And, you know, when we get back outside, I'm like, oh, who are these women? And he's like, oh, um, one, one of them is my cousin, that's her girlfriend, they're lesbians. And that was that, you know, I believed what he said. And then at some point, uh, did you find out that uh, Antonio was not his first name or the name he even went by? Yes, so I was staying here with him and I went to use the bathroom. When I went to use the bathroom, I found an ID in the bathroom. And I was like, oh, I was like, I'm like, well, I'm violating this person's privacy, but I'm gonna look at it anyway because, you know, I'm a, I'm a single woman, who could these people be, so. I, I look at his ID, I see his name. I was like, okay, I went back to the bed, and right next to him, he was sleeping, knocked out. I Googled his name, and I saw all this stuff about a missing person, a woman who, all this older woman who ran with him. Um, nobody had been, 
they only mentioned Lisa and him. And the, 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 it was a, he was a person of interest and a missing person. So of course I'm like panicking, freaking out in the room, like pacing back and forth. He's like, what's wrong? And I was like, oh, nothing, you know? And then um, I just, I never told him anything, you know? I kept it to myself. I was scared too, to say anything. I was just scared at the moment. And, and at that time, the article that you're seeing were just that it was a missing person, is that right? Mm -hmm. So then I was like, and let me, oh, sorry. Make sure you say yes or no, not the mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, so at that time you're seeing it as a missing person, and that's all you know at this point. Yes. Okay. And his name is in these articles, and Lisa Dykes' names are, are in these Yes. Articles. No mention of Anina Morano at that time. I thought that the girl was, the girl that I thought I saw them with when I read the article, I thought that was the girl that was missing. But I saw her hair only on the couch. So I'm like, oh, that's probably the girl, and she probably wants to be here. So I really didn't think much of it. I think I was freaking out this was happening. I didn't think much of it, because I thought that that's her. Um, and, um, but I guess you still continue to see Chuck. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and everything was fine in the way you, you and Chuck's relationship still, even though he's giving you this middle name as his name. Yes. Yep. Um, obviously now you've got these concerns seeing this missing person, but you think the person you saw that you now know is Nina. Yes. You think maybe that's missing. That's her, yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, at some point, did Chuck leave Miami? So, um, he started saying that he was gonna go to Tampa, out of town with his friends. I think there was a game going on at the time. And he's like, well, I'm gonna go to Tampa. You know, he was, he was gonna leave Tampa, and I was like, okay. And he, he ended up leaving. I stayed with him that night before he left. And then he left? And then he left. So. Did he come back at some point from that trip? Um, he came back, I want to say maybe like two or three weeks later, maybe two weeks later, he came back. It was like a surprise. Okay. He's like, hey, where are you? I was all with my friends. He's like, you going to spend tonight with me? And I'm like, I'm like, oh, aren't you in Tampa? He's like, oh, I'm, I'll be there in about two hours. I'm on the road, almost there. So he came back, and then this trip back to Miami, was it a long stay? Or no, it was very short. Maybe like 24 to 48 hours. He came back, he came, he... He came back, I think it was like January 16th or something like that, turning, uh, it was like the more, basically the morning of January 17th, like three, four in the morning-ish, I want to say. He came back, um, you know, we got up again. He's like, oh man, I left my keys in Tampa. Like, we should, we should rent a hotel. I'm like, okay. You know, we rented a hotel. Um, we hung out the next morning. I, we went to the beach together. And then um, that night I came back, we came back from the beach and then we went our separate ways after that and we met up again and I spent the night with him again. And then the next day I went home and I get a message from him. You know, he's like, you know, more like, hey, how are you today, you know? And I'm like, how are you? He's like, oh man, I had to leave again. I was like, what? He's like, yes, I had to leave, it was an emergency. I had to go. Is that the last time you saw him? No, that's the last time. Um, do you know where he went after that? No. When's last, when's, when is the next time you hear from him again? Um, I've heard from him every day. Even even when he left, he'd always call me and contact me. And he's like, oh, um, you know, I had to leave. Something came up with one of his friends or something that he had to go. Um, I don't know if it was New Orleans or Texas, but he had to go. I eventually found out, too, that he was from Texas. Because of us spending time together, I feel like it's only natural that people, the truth starts coming out. So that's how I knew that he wasn't a liar. He started telling me things um, through our, our time spending together that, you know, he was from Texas and that he's, I guess where he's originally from, telling me things about his family. So he told me he had to come, I don't remember if it was Texas or New Orleans, but he had to go handle something over there. Um, but you guys, like you said, you're still talking every day, either text or phone calls. Yes, every day. Um, and then at some point, um, and, and you, like you said, you kept what you read online to yourself. You never tell me you told anything. Never told me anything. Um, at some point, do you learn that he gets arrested? So, um, yes, I saw that that there was an arrest. Yeah, that, that they found from his body, and um, this is when I found out about Anina, even though that person existed. And um, yeah, that's what that's how I found out. So you heard about them finding Marisol's body? Yes. Uh, and then you hear that. 
Chuck was arrested. Do you know where he was arrested? Utah. Did you talk to him once he got arrested? The minute he got arrested, I went out of my way to look for him, public record, and um, I tried to reach out to him. He didn't call me back right away. He probably called me like mm, maybe three or four days later after he was arrested there. But he did call you from Utah jail? Yes. Okay. And what's going through your mind at this point now that you hear that uh, it wasn't just a missing girl, it was a murder? They found her body. I was in shock and I couldn't believe that the person I spent time with was this person. So did you talk to him then uh, about what happened? Of course I talked to him. He's like, I'm so sorry. You know, he's like, I'm like, well, you know, I knew that something was going on. He's like, you knew? I'm like, yes. I just never told you because I was scared at first and I also didn't know how to bring it up. It's just something hard to bring up, you know? He's like, and I, he's like, you never acted any different. I didn't act it. He never knew that something was weird or different. But um, he just told me that he didn't talk much about what happened, but he did say that um, he's just happy, this is over with, it's a weight off his shoulders, he's tired of running. He did say that. Did he eventually tell you the details about what uh, happened for him? Um, yeah, he told me the details, which are the same details that I heard in the news. He said, um, he told me that he met her in, um, in a nightclub in Texas. He told me that she approached him and that um, he said uh, that they spoke about being together that night, intimate, and he asked her to go to his hotel. He's like, oh, can we go to your hotel? And she's like, no, people are there. Let's go back to your place. He told me he didn't want to rent a hotel that night because it was, you know, it's not going to be long. So he took her back to his house. And he told me that he took her back to his house. He's, he goes, you know, we spent the night there. We did what we did. We were intimate. And that he woke up to um, Nina stabbing, held a stabbing motion, and that Lisa was in there, and that she, um, he said he pushed Nina off, and then Lisa like pushed him, and then he put his clothes on, he was you know, scared, put his clothes on and ran, left. That's the story he told me. And uh, you continue to talk, have you and Chuck continued to talk since this? Oh yes, every day. Mm -hmm. So you're still in communication with him? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and now you said just a second ago that he said Nina was stabbing her. Are you sure if that's what he told you? I'm sorry, not Nina, Lisa. <laughs> sorry about that. I get getting confused. He said he woke up to Lisa stabbing her, and that Nina and he pushed Lisa, and then Nina, and came, then Nina like came in and like uh, pushed him, and then he pushed you know right over he pushed her too, but that she like pushed him, and then he got up, got his clothes on, and and ran and left. Your time with Chuck, um, I know you mentioned being scared right hearing this news, but were you ever scared of him personally? Not at all. Um, I'll pass the witness. Mm -mm. You find out that this man, wait, am I supposed to? You may. Uh, defense exhibit number three. Uh, this is the person you keep referring to as Chuck? Yes, sir. And you find out that um, this man who uh, wasn't completely honest with you about who he was, wasn't he? That's correct. Uh, you had to, uh, can we turn this on? Thank you. You had to literally find, you found his ID. Uh, did you say it in the bathroom? In the bathroom. Uh, um, and that's when you learned his name was uh, Charles Beltran. Right? That's correct, yes. Beltran. Right? Yep. All right. And you said uh, he was very loving, nice, very convincing, wasn't he? Very, yes. Very charming. Extremely. I mean, you, you're still attracted to him, right? Yes, I am. You still, it's still like a love interest to you, right? Not a love interest, but a good friend, a good person. Mm -hmm. So you tell the members of the jury that, again, you're going to this apartment. Now, you don't know, I know that you saw the, the, the two women 
right? At the apartment, right? I saw two women at the apartment, yes. Okay, but as far as what other people were coming in and out of that apartment, you have no idea, do you? No. All you know is what he told you. Right. And I spent time there, I didn't see anybody else there. Right, but what I'm saying is when you were not there, you have no idea who all else she was communicating with, do you? Right. Uh, you indicated that even after you found out his name, that you went online, remember that? Yes. And you see that he's a person of interest and a missing person. That's right. Case. He's there asleep, right? Mm hmm. So, you have to answer up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but you don't wake up, Chuck, and say, hey, you know, what, 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 what's, what's all this? No, I did not. Because you're afraid, right? Of course. You're with someone um, that's the person of interest in a missing person's case, and now you just found out you don't really know anything about this guy, do you? Right. And so you were afraid. I was afraid because of the story and yeah, to bring why, it up. Why, so why didn't you wake him up and say, hey, Charles Beltran, uh, what's all this missing person stuff? Because I'm not going to ask him that <laughs> in the room with him like that. Because anything could have happened to you, right? Of course. So you were concerned about your safety, weren't you? Right, not because of his personality, though. Because it's, I'm in a situation that I don't know anyone here. Well, but you're the only person you're in the room with is him. But these other people are in the house. What other people? Uh, these people that, that were these two women. The story that you looked at had nothing to do with the two women. It had to do with him, correct? The story that I saw was him, and I saw the story was him and Lisa. When I when I found the ID, I had before that I had seen two women in the house. When I found the ID, so I thought that one of them was the missing girl, and the other one was Lisa. But I still don't know much of what's going on. So of course I'm afraid to bring it up. Um, to me, it was just. How do I bring this up? I don't know what could happen to me. You know, and I also didn't feel this person that I spent time with would do anything like that. There's no way. So you weren't afraid that you too could come up missing? No. Um, and that's because of all the love and kindness that um, Chuck had showed you, right? And not trying to come on to me like that, yes. So you felt safe with him, right? I felt safe, yes. And he's very convincing, right? Uh, I mean, you could call it that. Even though he wasn't being completely truthful with you. He has every reason not to be truthful. Excuse me? He has every reason not to be truthful. So he had reasons to Of lie, course. And that makes it okay? Um, it doesn't make it okay, but it's understandable. So he did lie to you, right? He, of course he did. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get right to the point. Uh, as far as... Um, When he went to Tampa, who did he go to Tampa with? He said his friends. Again, you don't know that he was referring to those girls, do you? No, I don't. All right, could have been anybody, right? Yep. Did he ever talk to you about uh, Santa Morta? Uh, no. Okay, and this, um, when you, at some point, you find out that, that, that this missing girl was actually dead, right? Right. And you still don't stop talking to Mr. Beltran, do you? Yeah, I did. No, I did not. In fact, you say that you talk to him while he's at jail. You, you, you're, you're actually searching him out, right? That's right. Yep. Trying to find a way to contact this guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. At some point, you contact him, and he confides in you and tells you the story of what happened. Right. What he says happened, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the version that he gives you is that he's with Maricela. They go back to their the house because he didn't want to go. They couldn't go to her hotel room, and he didn't want to purchase the hotel room, right? Right. And then they go back to the house in Mesquite, right? That's right. And... Um, have sex at some point, right. Lisa comes in stabbing him. That's correct. Well, tell me exactly what he told you. 
he told me that um, he's, you know, we were intimate. She came in. He woke up to her stabbing her. He said he, you know, woke up freaking out. He pushed her off. And that Nina was there and uh, she pushed him. All right, let me ask you this. Did he say anything about pinning Lisa up against the wall? Uh, yes, he mentioned that. that he pinned her up against the wall. Um, did he say, but he definitely told you that he woke up to Lisa stabbing her. Yes, with a stabbing motion. How many times? Oh, he never mentioned that. We never got into that. Okay. Now, have you been following this on the, the internet since we've been going to trial? Uh, not since trial, but before trial, yes. You have been following this on the internet no. since we've been in trial? Here? No. As far as um, what he was telling you at that time, he made it clear to you that Lisa was stabbing her, didn't he? The stabbing motion, yes. He woke up to like her holding her neck and a stabbing motion. Ma'am, you talking to the man on the phone. How did he didn't show you no stabbing motion? Did he show you a stabbing motion? No, he didn't. So you're talking to him on the phone, mm -hmm. and he's telling you he wakes up to her stabbing him. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Right. That's correct. But one thing he also told you was that Nina came into the room, correct? That's correct. Pushed him. Yes. And he ran out of there. Yep. You talked about talking to him while he's in jail. I mean, you're, you're still talking to him while he's in jail now. That's correct. So you say that he's just a friend, right? That's right. Uh, but are are y'all singing love songs to each other? Uh, we sing songs, all types of songs. Love songs, don't you? Like what love songs? I don't know. You tell me. What's, what what mm -hmm. songs are y'all singing on on the jail calls? Different songs that we like. Like what? Well, just songs that are on the radio. Different songs. Um, I went to a Beyonce concert. Sang some of her songs. All types of music. He's, a mu he's into music. But you don't deny you're singing love songs too. I have all, all types of songs. My, my question is, you don't deny that you've sung love songs to him. You want to call them love songs? Yeah. R&B? In just the short time that you spent with uh, Charles Beltran, um, do you agree with me that you are obsessed with him, aren't you? No. He's no. manipulated you like he's manipulated so many other women in his life. He never manipulated me. He doesn't need to manipulate me. I'm not easily manipulated. But you were? No, I was not. I'm a good judge of character. When I see somebody's a good person, you, I realize it. You're a good judge of character. You, you, you meet a man at the grocery store, right? That's right. Uh, he tells you, Judge, I'll, I'll pass it with you. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. You're welcome. Any regrets? No, Your Honor. May this witness be finally? No, just no. Thank you. You're free to leave, ma'am. Thank you. Call your next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Jasmine Cannon. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this case will be the truth, 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Yes, ma'am. You may be seated. Thank you. I see you have your phones with you. Uh, are they on silent? Yes, they are. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ma'am, can you uh, state your name and spell your name for the court reporter, please? Uh, my name is Jasmine Cannon, J-A-S-M-I-N-E, last name C-A-N-N-O-N. Okay. And uh, Ms. Cannon, you know Charles Beltran, right? I do. Uh, what do you call him? Chucky. Chucky. And you know Lisa Dykes? Yes. And uh, did you ever meet Nina Murata? No. Okay. So uh, how did you meet uh, Mr. Beltran? Um, I was walking to my car in Deep Ellum, and my friend was looking for a cigarette. He happened to have one, so we just stopped and talked to a group of friends. Okay. Uh, did you guys uh, chat for a while? Yeah, for about a good hour or so. And after chatting with him about an hour, did you guys exchange information so you could keep in contact? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and uh, did you guys eventually start dating? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, tell the jury just a little bit about uh, Dating Chuck? Spontaneous, fun, you know, he's funny. Um, I feel like we had a good relationship, a good friendship. We argued at times, I mean, we have a child together, so it was normal, but it wasn't anything like where he would, he's never even called me out my name or attempted to put his hands on me, anything like that. He's more so the type of person that runs away from his problems. So if we did have an argument, he'd just get up and leave and stop talking to me okay. for a long time. And about how long did you all, uh, I guess, have this dating relationship? About two and a half years. Uh, you said that you had a child together, and that's Charlie, is that right? Yes. Uh, do you have another uh, child? I do. Okay, and you have an older son, is that correct? Yes, I have a 16-year-old son, and Charlie, she's four. And uh, how was uh, Chuck with your older son? Amazing. Um, they had a really good relationship. He would always take him to do things, uh, unfortunately more so than Charlie, but he did have a good relationship with my son. As far as Charlie, was he, you know, the kind of dad changing diapers there, helping feed, stuff like that? No. Um, did you all live together for a time? Yes. And um, how did his club lifestyle affect that? It was horrible. He would not come home. He would have my car for days at a time and not come back or answer the phone. Um, just staying out all night or for days. That's just how he was. So it certainly wasn't conducive to the family life? Not at all. At some point, did you all, uh, I guess, decide and separate from this living arrangement? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember about when that was? Right before we had, uh, I had my daughter. So he never lived there with you and Charlie? No. Did he come around and see Charlie from time to time? Sometimes. Uh, but not, not that often? No. Um, did you all still maintain, I guess, a, a friendship or, or relationship after uh, Charlie's birth? Yes. Okay. And um, did you guys talk frequently? Yes. Um, and how old did you say Charlie is now? She's four. Four. So was there a time, uh, I guess, tell me, when did you learn that he had moved in with Lisa? Uh, Charlie was maybe about two months old. So a couple months uh, after living with you, um, is when you learned that he moved in with Lisa? Yes, uh, we had got into an argument a little bit after she was born. He was driving a white SUV that belonged to Miss Dykes, and that's how I found out that he was living at her home. And did he tell you who she was to him? He said that she was just like a lawyer friend and that she was just helping him with money for the most part. Um, and then one night he needed a ride to her job off North Simmons Freeway. And so he, he needed to go get some money from her. And so I asked him, how deep is your guys' relationship? And then that's when he began to tell me that it was more sexual 
but it was more of like him getting money from her and him giving her sexual favors. Now, at some point, uh, so you learn that he's living there. Uh, at some point, does he start talking about Nina? Um, no. Okay. See, at that time, uh, Charlie, had you ever gone through the court system to, I guess, uh, legalize that or, or have any kind of legal documentation of that? No, I'm not really the type of person that believes in child support. That's just me. So at the time, even though he wasn't really just helping me, I had never went to court to get full custody of her. I was attempting to be fair with him. But when I received the papers and everything that was in those documents, that's when I went ahead and called to get like legal custody on paper of her. Okay. And these documents, about when did you receive these documents? Um, maybe like August, maybe September or August. Um, it was a few months before this incident happened with uh, Maricela. Okay. Uh, had Chuck ever indicated to you that he wanted full custody of his dog? Never. Now, you said that you got the documents um, and, and you said that they were fake. Is yes. that correct? Uh, what, you know, what did the documents say? The documents were stating that I had to give him full custody of Charlie. She was going to be living at Miss Dyke's home. I would be paying a certain amount of money in child support. I got to see her once a weekend every month. I was not allowed to take her outside of Texas ever without permission. Um, and that somebody basically would be coming to take her from me to give to deliver her to Chucky or to Lisa and then like on each of the papers it was like a stamp and it would have their signatures not his but Lisa and Nina's signatures on these papers okay. so you, to this day you've never met Nina never okay. you just saw her signature on that correct document. and that's how I found out about who she was now, um, how did that make you feel when you got these documents? I was livid. I mean, had you been a good mom to Charlie? Absolutely, to both of my kids. And to your son? Absolutely. Um, I mean, is your son involved in activities, sports, things like he that? He plays basketball very heavily. He plays travel ball. He plays high school ball. So I am very active with his ball. I mean, and not that this makes a difference, but I am a single parent to both of my kids. My son does not have a father either. His father did pass away. And so I make sure that I do everything that I can for both of my children. Hi, what did you do when you uh, got these documents? I called Lisa's job. And, and I, at, in the beginning, I wanted to be a woman about things and figure out exactly what it was that she was attempting to do. And she started to get snappy on the phone, so I got snappy back and I cussed her out. Okay. Uh, and when you cussed her out, what did she do? She hung up the phone. Now, you said that she got snappy back. Uh, was she accusing you of being a bad mom? Basically, and basically trying to tell me that I was pretty much upset that her and Chucky were in a relationship and I didn't have him anymore. But that was not the case because I talked to him frequently. I mean, I didn't want to be in a relationship with him. Our friendship was good enough. As far as uh, Chuck, uh, did you talk to him about this? I did. And what did he say? He had told me that he didn't know anything about it and that he would talk to her to get her to, to for them to back off. Um, I don't really know if that happened though because uh, I started to receive phone calls from unwanted, like from um, private calls. Ob objection, Your Honor, to the narrative. Just saying. And um, you said that you're not sure uh, if he had her back off. Were you receiving strange phone calls I was. of unidentified people? Objection, yes. Your Honor, to leaving. To stay, don't leave. What kind of phone calls were you receiving? Block calls of people just on the phone, but not really saying anything. So I just assumed they were messing with me, so then I just changed my phone number. Uh, you said at some point that you got, 
went to court, filed the legal paperwork, and things of that nature. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. At that time, did you put a uh, check on child support? I opted out. Did this cause uh, some problems between you and uh, Chuck and this kind of co-parenting friendship? No. Um, at some point, you actually saw Mr. Beltran on the night that uh, Maricel went missing, is that yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. And uh, tell the jury where you saw him. Punk Society in Deep Ellum. And uh, were you there alone or with other people? I was with a group of my friends. Uh, we walked into Punk Society, and he was standing at the bar. Um, I don't. We got into an argument. I feel like it was probably over the whole Lisa situation and the paper she sent me. Um, as I said before, he's not a person that likes to kind of confront situations. He's more of a runner. So he then proceeded to walk over to Dax, which is his friend, and they left out the back door and <coughs> left. He left his drink at the bar and everything, and I didn't see him for the rest of that night. Okay. And um, was that the last time you saw him for some time? Yes, that's the last time I saw him. Um, around, at, on Chris, around Christmas, he sent both of my kids gifts. The address that he sent them from came from Pennsylvania. But I didn't talk to him. He just and and you were and so that was Christmas. You get some gifts, but you you don't talk to him. And, and was that unusual for your uh, friendship or relationship with Jeff? No, for us not to talk. No, it wasn't a normal. It wasn't. No, it was normal for us not to talk at per for periods of time. Okay, so it was normal for you guys not to talk. Yes. Uh, when was the next time that you recall seeing uh, Chuck? March. Okay, and uh, was that in Dallas? Yeah, Irving, yes. In, in Irving? Yes. Okay, and is that where you lived at the time? Correct. Uh, did you live in an apartment or a house? An apartment. Okay, and how did he get in touch with you? He came to the door, uh, he knocked on the door, um, but I didn't answer because he had the peephole covered. And I said, who is it? And he said, it's Aunt. I don't ever call him by his first name or his middle name. And I said, who? Because I couldn't hear him. And he said, it's Anthony. And I'm like, who? So at that time, my daughter's crying. She's in the kitchen. I just got home from bringing groceries and from getting groceries from Walmart. I walked to the kitchen to grab her really quick. I come back to the door and I open it. He's not there. Okay. And how did you uh, get in touch with him? So I closed the door, I called my mom, and I said, I'm pretty sure Chucky was just at my house. I go into the kitchen, and the way that my apartment was, I lived on the first floor. The glass would come from the kitchen patio and go all the way, kind of all the way around to my bedroom. He threw a plastic box uh, with like the rose teddy bear in the middle of it, it's see-through. He threw it out the window and it made a loud boom, of course. Um, in the box, there was a note, and the note said, hey, can you call me? And did you call him? I didn't call him, I sent him a text, and I said, what's wrong with you? Okay. And uh, what did he say? He called me, and then we were on the phone, and he said, I miss you guys, I wanna see you, and I said, what's going on with you? And he was like, well, just come and meet me, and I'll tell you everything. Around that time, it was a little bit cold, so I, got Charlie dressed and we went to meet him. He told me to meet him at a McDonald's, but um, on the way he called me to see where I was at and I was right across the street at a 7-Eleven from the McDonald's and he said, oh, I'll just drive over there. So I just stayed parked at the 7-Eleven. Okay. After you guys met at 7-Eleven, did you guys talk for a while? Yes. And uh, what happened after that? He asked to spend the night. So. I asked him what was going on when we were there. We got in, he, he was driving a Jeep Wrangler at the time. We got in the Jeep Wrangler. Um, I asked him what was going on and he said that he didn't know because he had already spoken to detectives and that they were no longer wanting him for questioning. And I said, well, what happened with this girl? And he said, well, I'm pretty sure she went back home. She was so adamant about me getting her 
you know, back to the back to the her where she was coming from because she had an early fight. And I said, okay. He said, can I spend the night? And I said, yes, but I have company over. At the time, my friend was there with her children, and then of course my two kids. So I explained to him like they're all there, so it's probably going to be loud. And he was like, that's fine. Then we went back to my house and we stayed the night. Uh, so he stays the night with you, and uh, was your son there at the time? He was, yes. Okay. So stays the night with you and your kid. You said your mom's there. And, and she wasn't there. I was on the phone with her. Okay. And um, you spend the night there. Did he kind of seem like everything was normal? Yeah. Okay. Everything was fine. He wasn't acting unlike like he normally. He was telling me about going to all these different places and working and seeing Niagara Falls. It was almost like he was on vacation. Uh, did he tell you where all he went? To Miami, to New York, to Pennsylvania, to Mexico. And uh, so that that was kind of the conversation that evening. Yes, right? ma'am. And you were under the impression that he had already spoken with detectives. Yes. Now, uh, you later found out that wasn't true. Correct. correct. Okay. And he had also mentioned that he missed you guys and missed the kids. Correct. Um, at some point, um, I guess, how long did he stay with you? Let me back up just a little bit. How long did he stay with you? So he, he spent the night. Uh, the next day, I was kind of sick, so we went to the emergency room. We stayed that day, to, that whole entire day together. We went out to eat. My son had a basketball tournament in Houston that weekend. So I told him, you can come with us or you can stay here because he was doing laundry and he said that he was tired of driving. So he said, I'll just stay here. And me and my kids went to Houston. He was talking to me the entire time um, on the phone. Uh, that son- uh, uh, Your Honor, I'm gonna object non-responsive and narrative. Just saying, ask your next question. Uh, so he stayed in Dallas and you were driving to Houston, correct? Correct. Were you guys talking on the phone the whole time? Yes. Okay. And uh, how long was the tournament? That weekend, so two days. Did he stay in Dallas for those two days? At least I thought. On the way home, he told me that he was no longer at my house and that he needed to go to a friend's house in New Orleans to drive to drop off that Jeep Wrangler. Okay, so when you got back, he, he was gone, and he had told you he had gone back to the New Orleans. Yes. Um, at some point, did he, uh, and he said something about taking the Jeep back, correct? Correct. Okay, at some point, did he uh, call you from New Orleans and, and talk to you? He did. He asked me to come and get him. And did you go get him? Yes. And uh, where did y'all go after that? Back to my house. Okay, and why did you need to go get him? He just said that he needed a ride back to Dallas. He wasn't going to take the Jeep Wrangler back. He needed a ride back to Dallas. He was going to get ready to go to New York, back to his friend's house, but he needed to get back to Dallas first. Did he tell you who he was with uh, at all these places? You no. Know, all that? He never named any names. And uh, when you guys got back to Dallas, um, what happened next? We got back to Dallas, he wanted to go to New York, um, and then he changed his mind. He said that he needed to make some money and he wanted to move to Vegas to start over, basically. He felt like his reputation was just shot out in Dallas because of him being all over the news. So he asked me if I would ask my brothers um, if he could do some work with him. Uh, yes, my both of my brothers live in Utah, and yes, they do sell drugs and so he asked if he could go to doubt to go to utah to get some work from them so that he can move to vegas okay. and um so when you talk to your brothers did they agree to let him go to utah and stay with them for a while yes they did and um i mean that's a long drive right too long and were you wanting to go i did not want to go okay but um uh, your brothers wanted to see you. And my dad. And your dad's there as well. Yes. Um, and Chuck wanted you to go too, right? Yes. Um, had your brothers and dad seen your daughter Charlie in a while? Not in person. They've never met her. Okay. 
And so my dad was like, just bring, just come and I want to see you and I want to see my granddaughter for the first time. Um, what car did you guys get with? I got a rental. Okay. And so you guys rent a car and drive to Utah, is that, is that right? Yes. Did everybody's, everything seem okay at that time? Everything was perfectly fine. Um, did you kind of get them set up with groceries and clothes and things like that? We went grocery shopping. I went. To, we went to go get them clothes. Uh, we were sitting in restaurants eating like it was nothing out of the norm. Um, he was staying with your brothers in Utah. Correct. And uh, how did you and Charlie get back to Texas? I got a plane ticket to go back home because I was leaving the rental there. I wasn't going to drive back by myself with her. Now, when you got back, is that when you started getting some phone calls? I got a call from the U.S. Marshals. And they were looking for Chuck, right? Yep. Was it then that you realized that he wasn't completely honest with you about talking to the detectives? Yeah, I was pretty spooked. Um, while I'm actually on the call with the U.S. Marshals, one of my friends sent me the article that her body had been found and he was wanted for capital murder. So this was all at the end of March, is that right? Yes. Okay. So he's actually in Utah uh, when you get the word that Maricela's body had been found. Yes, ma'am. At that point, had he told you what had happened? No. Uh, had he indicated to you that he was uh, tired of, of traveling and going places and, and wanted to kind of settle? Yeah, he wanted to settle in Vegas. Had he mentioned Lisa or Nina at that point? No. And uh, what did you do when you found out the marshals were looking for him and you found out um, that Maricela's uh, body had been found? I called him. And what did he say? I was telling him, like, I was asking him to tell me the truth because of what are you doing, and then you're at my family's house. You're, you're going to get all of us in trouble. And he was like... He was in the process of getting ready to tell me what was happening. And my dad's on the phone, and they're like, well, you know, he needs to get, basically he's gonna get out of there. He wanted to go get a hotel to get away from them. While we're on the phone, he says, somebody's knocking on the door, but the peephole is covered. I'm gonna call you right back. I'm still on the phone on the three-way call with my dad. My dad's like, well, I'm on the way over there to get him. We'll just get him a room so that he can, we can be away from all of this, and but that didn't happen. Okay. While you were on the phone with him, did you learn that he was arrested? No, I didn't know right away. My dad had pulled my dad pulled up, but I guess they were in unmarked cars, so he wasn't sure or not if they had arrested anybody at that time. He just kind of sat outside of the apartment complex. The way that my brother's apartment complex is, it's a gated community, so he sat kind of like on the outside and didn't go into the parking garage or anything Your like that. Your object to this uh, the speculation, she doesn't know where he was parked or anything like that. She's on the phone with him. Okay, he told okay, me. Okay, ma'am, you oh, can't sorry. speak right now. I have to make a ruling and then you can only speak when you're asked a specific question and then try to only answer that specific question. Yes, ma'am, sorry about that. Thank you. All right, sustain, ask your next question. Okay. So you aren't there, you're just listening to your dad. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, did you learn that uh, Chuck had been arrested later on? Yes. Okay. And um, your brothers got arrested too, is that correct? Yes. Okay. They eventually got released. Yes. Um, but when Charles was arrested, um, he stayed in jail. Is yes. That correct? Did you talk to him on the phone? Yes, he called me. And uh, what did you all talk about? He asked me if I could help him get a lawyer. And did you, what did you tell him? I told him yes. Okay. And uh, when you started trying to find him a lawyer, um, what were the lawyers telling you that they, you needed to know? They told me that I needed to know everything so that they could know what kind of case this was. So when I did talk to him, I told him that he needed to tell me what happened from the beginning to the end. Okay. And what did he tell you happened that night? He said that that night after he left, he had met Maricela and with Dax, and that they had eventually decided to go back to his house. But she was thirsty, 
or wanted something from the store. So he said that they drove to 7-Eleven first. Once they left 7-Eleven, they went to the house, to Lisa's house, and he said that they were smoking and drinking. So he said we were pretty cross faded and we were up talking at first and then they had sex and then they fell asleep. He said that when he woke up, he, when he woke up, Lisa was on top of her, stabbing her. He said that in the beginning, he just thought it wasn't real. And he got up and attempted to get her, Lisa, off of uh, Maricela, and they ended up falling on the ground. And then he said that at that point, he's coming out of the room to use the restroom to come back in because he's still not believing what's happening. He comes back in the room to get dressed. He was like, and you know how I am, I just run from everything. And so then he said that that's when Nina was coming in the room at the time and then he left in that white SUV to go to Dax's house. And um, did he, do you recall if he told you how he got Lisa off of Maricela? He never got her off of her, he just pushed her and they both fell to the ground. Uh, after he told you this, um, what'd you do with that information? I called his lawyer, oh, I called his lawyer back and told the lawyer what he had told me. Okay. Uh, have you continued to remain in contact with, with uh, Chuck? Yes. All right, yeah, pass the witness cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Cannon, I, Your Honor, I, I can't see Ms. Oh, Cannon. Oh, sorry. It's, yeah, she didn't move a little bit over there. Okay, thank you. Is that good? Yes, that's, that's right. Okay. okay. All right, Ms. Cannon, I'm Valerie Baston, and I'm one of Lisa's attorneys, and I'm gonna ask you a lot of questions, okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, so you stated earlier you never met Nina, but you met Lisa. When, when did you remember meeting Lisa? I didn't meet her, I called her. So you just talked to Lisa on the phone? Yes. But this would have been months after she and Chuck uh, had this relationship? Yes. And you said that um, Lisa and Nina sent you some fake papers. Yes. Okay. But these papers were actually filed in the 254th Judicial District Court, correct? No, I don't believe so. You don't remember seeing a court number on there where Charles Beltran was the petitioner in a fraternity suit? No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And um, when you found all this out, did this kind of take you back? It Were you kind of taken aback by all of it? That absolutely. Okay. And um, it's disturbing to you. Very much so. I. This family has to suffer for no reason whatsoever. And at the time, I definitely put myself in her mother's shoes. I have children of my own. I, I wouldn't know what to do. So, Miss Cannon, so you never knew that Chuck or Charles actually had a warrant out for his arrest for capital murder? Did no, you? no, I did not. You didn't check. Um, <coughs> You didn't check any news sites or police reports when he came to you saying that he needed your help? No, I didn't. Okay. If I'm being honest with you, I don't even know how to really just do stuff like that. Um, I'm not very knowledgeable when it comes to police, court things. I, I just don't know. Okay. And But were you hearing anything from your friends and family? that Charles was wanted? No, but I was receiving, it was a lot of harassment um, for the people on the other side. It caused me to have to completely get rid of my social media accounts because they were attacking myself, my son who has an Instagram, his family, like his mother and things of that nature. Um, but I, 
wasn't really getting a lot from my friends. It was just more what it happened when she went of missing. outside people. Thinking yes. Because you were connected to Charles through your child. Right. They were coming after you. Absolutely. And it was terrifying, wasn't it? Yes. Um, now, if you knew Chuck had a warrant for his arrest, arrest would you have tried to help him? I would have t I would have taken him to to the police department myself. Okay. What are you doing? Okay, because you know to to help him that would have been like harboring a fugitive. That that's you mean helping him like hiding him or do you yes. mean help? No, I wouldn't have hit him at all. Okay. I would have taken him to the to the police department myself. Okay. And during this time, he told you that he had talked to the detectives, but he made it appear like they had cleared him. Correct. <laughs> so he's a he's. He's a pretty good liar, isn't he? Because he had you believing this. Yes or no? Yes. And he put not only you and your son and your daughter at risk, but he put your mom, your dad, your brothers at risk. Correct. And they could have been charged with harboring a fugitive or helping helping a fugitive. So not my mom, but... But your dad and your brothers. Yes. And he's talking to you that he's just making it seem like he's just traveling the world. Yes. Not a care in the world. Yes. Okay. But then you later find out that this girl was, was brutally murdered. Yes. And he was involved in the murder. Yeah, to a certain extent, yes. Okay. Now, um... <clears throat> You said that you got a rental and you drove him to Utah. Yes. Okay. Were you having to pay for things for him? Like the rental, getting him set up? Did he have any money on his, of his own? He had some cash. He had. But was most of the money coming from you? Were you basically taking care of him? Kind of, yes. Okay. And um, now... Miss Miss Canna, I want to get to the part where um, <clears throat> he's actually telling you about what happened to Marisol. Mm -hmm. um, he said that they were smoking and they were drinking. Yes. Did he tell you what they were smoking? Weed. Okay. Do you know if it was laced with anything? No, okay. it wasn't laced. But you don't know that for sure? I don't know for sure, but... I highly doubt it was laced. Okay. But he told you they were, I'm going to use this shit-faced, that they were really messed up. Cross-faded. Oh, cross-faded. Okay. Yes. Cross-faded, okay. And you know that Charles, he sells drugs himself. No. He, he didn't? No. Did you ever know him to use ecstasy? From time to time. What about any other stuff like Percocet or anything else like that? No. And um, he said they're talking, they had sex, they fell asleep. He wakes up with Lisa on top of Marisol. Yes, ma'am. And not only was she on top, but she's stabbing Marisol. Yes, ma'am. Did he say how many times? No, he, he did not. Okay. And then he says he just pushes her off. Yes, ma'am. And then he gets up and goes to the restroom. Yes, ma'am. And then he comes back, and what does he tell you he sees when he comes back from the restroom? Maricela was on the ground, but Lisa was down there too. And so he was saying that he was more so of in shock of what was going on. And uh, he didn't go back and attempt to help because of the shock. At that time, Nina walked in and he walked out. Okay, so he said it was because he was in so much shock. Yes. That's why he didn't help Marisol. In the beginning, he attempted to help, but then afterwards, he so just... In the, okay. Because so he the, pushed her, he pushed Lisa, mm -hmm. trying to push her off of Maricela to help her in the beginning. And after that, after they fell on the ground, that's when he went to the restroom. Instead of trying to break them up completely, he goes off to the restroom. Correct. I'm going to ask you, did that even make sense to you? I'm not, not really, but to okay. me, I mean. Oh, that's, that's okay. That's okay. It didn't make sense to you. Right. Okay. Um, 
And then he also told you he was in the white SUV. Yes. Okay. All right. I passed the witness, Your Honor. Can you read the record? There you go. May this witness be final? Oh, no objection. Yes. Yes. Uh, just a couple more questions, if you would permit me, Your Honor. Okay. Sure. Ms. Cannon, did you know that Charles had gone to prison? He had gone to state prison and federal prison? Yes. Okay. Did you know what religion he practiced? No. So you don't know anything about Santa Morte? No. Okay. I passed the witness, Your Honor. Anything further? No, Your Honor. May this witness be final? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you, ma'am. You are free to leave and go back to business. Thank you. Call your next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Leo Getz. swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, sir, can you state your name and uh, spell your name for the court report, Yes. Uh, my name is Detective James Getz. First name is J-A-M-E-S. Last name is G-O-E-T-Z. Okay. I uh, introduce you as Leo Getz. You <laughs> or is that it's a, a nickname from uh, Lethal Weapon. Okay. Uh, Joe Pesci. Yeah. <laughs> Had that for a while. Let's see, I didn't get the Joker. <laughs> um, and is your title detective? Yes. Okay, detective gets. Uh, can you tell the jury what it is that you do for a living and your qualifications to do so? Yes, I've been a Dallas police officer for 15 years. Um, the last five I spent in our um, child crime crimes against children unit. Um, spent some time in child exploitation. The last. Uh, I guess four and a half, I've been in internet crimes against children. So we deal with a lot of um, online exploitation of children. And also with that, we get some forensic background. Um, so I have some experience in uh, forensic cell phone extractions and uh, mobile de device uh, stuff. And um, how does it work that you get a cell phone to uh, perform an extraction? Uh, so generally the process is, um, we have several spots in the unit that, or in the department, sorry, the department that uh, detectives can bring uh, cell phones if they need an extraction done on them. We're one of them. Uh, me and a few of the other detectives are all certified to use the Cellbrite tool, um, which is just a company that, that specializes in phone extractions. So really it's just up to that detective, usually, um, what unit they want to bring it to. Um, and yeah, they decide um, and they bring you know, phones to us, they bring them to our fusion center and then our other um, financial crimes unit. But really it's just up to the detective to show up and bring it to us. Uh, did you have uh, the opportunity to extract a phone um, kind of under this incident back in, I don't recall, do you recall when you uh, received a phone for this incident? I want to say it was the spring of 2021. The exact date, I'm not sure. It would be on that um, report I did. March 31st, 2021? Sounds about right, if that's what's on there. Okay. It's been a while. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Now, uh, I'm showing you what's already been uh, admitted into evidence as states exhibit 316. Now, there's a number of phones in here. Uh, do you recall which what the name of the phone was that you were asked to extract? Yeah, so it was a, a Rebel 4, which is a T-Mobile brand phone. Um, so it should be this one right here. Okay, this phone right here? Correct. And so um, as part of your extraction, what do you do? Um, I mean, we just plug it, pretty much we plug it into the machine. There's a few steps. Um, the, the, usually the, each phone is a little bit different. The, the program itself will tell us what steps to take. Um, we have to change a few of the little like settings and then um, click a button and the phone 
the, the program will just kind of do the work. It pulls out essentially an image um, that it can capture of the phone, which is essentially a copy. Um, each phone, based on security you know, stuff built into the phone, uh, we get different levels of, of data from that. Um, but essentially, it's, it's a, uh, uh, an unreadable copy to the human eye. And then we plug it into their other, their other part of the tool, which is like a second part. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. But, uh, basically, you plug it in there, and that, that program parses it out, all, that, all the ones and zeros, and turns it into a readable format of data for you to be able to, to go through and review, or to detect it, usually. Okay. Uh, that particular uh, phone that, that you extracted, it was a T-Mobile, I believe, um, Rebel phone. Is that kind of a normal brand that you would get? Uh, we get those a uh, fairly decent amount, but it's, it's kind of like an off-brand that's just... Uh, it's like a T-Mobile off-brand, almost generic, that you would buy. It's not your Samsung or uh, iPhone that we're most commonly used to. But it's it's pretty, pretty I think it's only, well, I don't want to say that because I don't know for sure. But I know it's one of T-Mobile's main, like, just generic phones they sell with their plans. Okay, did that appear to be, that phone appear to be fairly new? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And when a... Detective Ortiz uh, brought that phone over to you. Did it have the company sign certain warrants? Uh, yes. Okay. Otherwise, you wouldn't extract. Correct. Now, you said before that you put the, I guess you extract the phone and the report comes out in a Celebrite format. Is that correct? Correct. Have you had the opportunity to look through the Celebrite uh, report in this case? Yes, I have. And I'm showing you what's been marked States Exhibit 338. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. Okay, is that the Celebrite report for this phone? Yes. Okay, and then also States 339 and 340. Mm-hmm. And, uh... <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> and States 339 and 340, are those, uh, I guess, reports pulled directly from the Celebrite... Uh, report in States 338 uh, concerning specific conversations. Yes, they are. Your Honor, State offers States 338 for record purposes and then States 339 and 340 for all purposes. Thank you. Tendering to defense counsel.
defense asked her approach to get some clarification about uh, states as if it's 339, 340, which phone they were from. Uh, the state informed the defense that they were from the defendant's phone at the time of her arrest in Florida. And the defense said, I'm going to object, and I informed uh, the attorneys that I would sustain that objection at this time. Is there anything you want to put on the record? Uh, Your Honor, I believe uh, at the, the bench, um, we clarified that these uh, text messages and this Celebrite report are directly from the phone seized from Lisa in Florida at her Orlando arrest. And uh, the contents, which we have not discussed, but the contents of the phone um, are text messages from that phone that was seized from Lisa to one of the phones is to Lover. Mr. Beltran text, uh, testified previously on Friday about some of the contents of that message that he, message exchange that he received from uh, Miss Dykes uh, from an unknown phone number, but it, it was Miss Dykes. Uh, the contents of that message are, of his testimony, are in the messages uh, that we presented to the court. The second, and I believe it is uh, if I may, Mr. Harris, um, the messages that I'm referencing right now are in States 339.
other objection regarding this is a different issue regarding the reason I was sustaining the objection where we're at right now in the trial. So the one that, may I, Your Honor? The one that Judge Belita was was down for, is that what you're talking about? I'm sorry? Judge Belita, was she down here for a hearing? That was a separate, that was kind of a a separate issue. He wanted to have a hearing regarding the issue, a Frank's hearing. I'm going to allow him to to question Detective Ortiz about the affidavit right now since we're at the portion of talking about this specific warrant and this specific vote. He's down here. Is he in the building or is he at the He's in the building, yeah. Right. Last time I saw him, he was in the building. That was an hour ago. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
detective. You Good testified man. earlier in this case? Uh, no, ma'am. All right. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, <coughs> the truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys. I will. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, Mr. Harris, this is your witness, and you may proceed regarding uh, State's Exhibit 333. Thank you. The search warrant affidavit for the T-Mobile and iPhone that were testimony has shown that these were the two phones taken from the defendant at the time of her arrest. Thank you, Judge. Um, Detective uh, Ortiz, I just wanted to ask you specifically, because you're the one who actually swore uh, to this affidavit, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, and when you swear to the affidavit, you're swearing to a judge that the information within the four corners of the document uh, is true and correct, correct? Yes, sir. All right, and I just want to ask you specifically about some of the information that was contained in the search warrant that you guys are saying established your probable cause. Because that's what this search warrant is supposed to be doing, right? Yes, sir. Establishing your probable cause to arrest, uh, not only arrest uh, Ms. Dykes, but also uh, to be able to search the contents of her phone that was collected from her when she was arrested, correct? Correct. All right. Oh, may I approach this? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, okay. Right. Um, and I'm just going to uh, get right to the point. I wanted to ask you about specific information uh, that was contained in the arrest warrant. Uh, at the time you swear to the arrest warrant, um, you guys uh, basically told the judge that um, there were hair samples that were found uh, that y'all believe to be the complainants, is that correct? Correct. Were there ever hair samples that were found that belonged to the complainant in that Audi? Inside the, the Audi? Uh, I'm, as far as I know, none of the hairs actually uh, were uh, the complaint is. Okay, but in your search warrant, you said uh, during the search of the 2014 Black Audi uh, that was uh, conducted by, uh, was that New York State? New York State Police, Police correct. Uh, concrete material found in the rear wheel well of the vehicle appeared to match uh, the same type of color of concrete used at the uh, concrete plant where suspect Dykes and Moreno uh, showed to have traveled uh, on the date, night of the offense, right? Correct. All right, but in reference to the uh, hair sample, you all indicated that the hair sample was found in the trunk of the vehicle. The hair sample seemed to match that of the complainant uh, and not that of Moreno or Dykes. Uh, okay, the sample is currently being analyzed. So at that time, uh, y'all just said it, it seemed to match her. You didn't say it was hers, correct? Correct. It seems to match uh, the complainants, but they were not, uh, basically, we haven't confirmed because they were not done at SWIFT with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, I don't know, uh, trying to analyze the, uh, the hair. Okay, but also included in the affidavit, you indicated that y'all received information from SWIFT uh, that they collected DNA, blood uh, from one of the carpets and pads uh, from what believed to be Beltran's bedroom, right? Correct. And the blood was found, the, the blood found was a match to the complainant, correct? Correct. All right, and then that there was an unknown male and female DNA profile uh, were found in the carpet by Swift, right? Correct. And then y'all indicated to that judge that the unknown DNA is believed to belong to Charles Beltran, Lisa Dykes, and Nina Morano, right? I don't know Nina Morano, yes. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay, but that blood didn't belong to them, did it? No, we, uh, I believe we didn't have a, uh, the, I guess the defendants or the, or the uh, suspect at that time, their uh, DNA. But they have not been compared yet. I know, but, but, but my point is, Y'all are leading a magistrate or the judge that y'all presented this to to believe that the unknown DNA 
that was found in that carpet in Mr. Beltran's room belonged to Mr. Beltran, Ms. Dykes, and Ms. Morano, correct? Yes, believed to be uh, one of them. But correct. that wasn't true, was it? Like I said, it was believed to be, so. My question is, that wasn't true, was it? Well, not uh, after the, uh, it was done, the uh, sweat was done, then it, it didn't belong to any of them, okay. except for the complainants. Okay, so I guess what I'm getting at is as far as the information that you swore to, um, not only was that hair sample not that of the complainant in the, in the case, even though y'all believed it was, right? But at that time we believed it was the, uh, the complainant, the hair samples. Okay. Um, but Specifically, the blood that y'all indicated as a problem as a part of your probable cause to get into Mrs. Dyke's phone, uh, that later turned out not to be the blood of Mr. Beltran, Ms. Dykes, nor Ms. Moreno, correct? Correct. Okay. So again, that that's the incorrect information, wasn't it? Well, after the uh, it, the Swiss was done with the investigation, then uh, yeah, it turned out to be incorrect. All right. Do you have any argument you want to put on the record, uh, Mr. Harris? Um, just that, um, again, these officers, I understand, I don't believe that, um, I don't have any reason to believe that um, they were acting in bad faith when they gave this false, false information, Judge. I just think that they were under a lot of pressure to obtain some type of uh, arrest in this case, and as a result of that, uh, they did uh, overstep their bounds and include information that was incorrect and uh, mislead uh, the judges that signed these affidavits, uh, uh, that signed these warrants and given them permission to not only arrest uh, Ms. Dykes, but also to search her phones on a fishing expedition to further support their case. And, and I just, again, we urge the court that, that that's improper and uh, uh, any information uh, garnered from uh, these arrest warrants, which include, which included false information, uh, should be suppressed. All right, thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Detective. You can stand down. Mm -hmm. Right. The court finds that the affidavit for search warrant in State Exhibit 333 uh, is sufficient, that the information contained therein was what the police had at the time and uh, was not made in bad faith uh, and is fully sufficient to establish probable cause to search the T-Mobile phone and other phone, the iPhones that were confiscated from the defendant Lisa Dykes at the time of her arrest in Florida. Now, before I bring the jury back in, I'd like to see if the state can um, lay the predicate for state exhibits 338, 33, well, 339, well, 339, 340. Yes, Rob. Yes, we're all right, come on. Sorry. 
to take one off your docket. <laughs> Thank you. Five zero zero one two three nine nine three two. Is that the same I M E I number on uh, states three seventeen the corresponding box? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. And uh, in states three thirty three, the affidavit for search warrant uh, is that the same I M E I number for uh, this T Mobile phone that which is states three sixteen. Yes. Yes, it is. Now, you uh, conducted a, an extraction of that phone and generated a Celebrite report uh, based on that extraction. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And on your report, does it state the uh, phone number, I'm oh, sorry, the phone um, and the IME number on your report that corresponds to the phone that you uh, extracted? Yes, it should. Let me find it. Redoing this format. So the Rebel, Rebel, I'm sorry, Rebel 2 Plus. Um, I'm, sure, I'm not sure where the IMEI is on in this report. It's on that first part, but I don't see it on there. See it on the main pages of this report, this particular report. Um, when you generate a report that on Celebrate, <clears throat> does it generally have the IME number located somewhere? It generally does. Um, I believe the report that I created of my extraction, I would have taken a picture um, of this screen of the phone with the IMEI on it.
are there any other um, indications or uh, numbers on that phone that would correspond with the, the device that you um, extracted? Any other identifiers? So, that's a great question. Some of these other numbers you turn on the box. So on here, well, let me just go to the second page. So there's some numbers on there. So I don't see any that were pulled on this report that are actually on the box. Detective, you have uh, done several extractions um, over the course of your career. Um, in this case, uh, do you personally recall receiving the, uh, this particular phone um, and doing that extraction and providing that extraction to uh, Detective Ortiz? I do. Okay, and you've no. observed, you've looked at the extraction report with me this morning. Um, and can you state uh, whether or not that extraction report that we looked at this morning and that is uh, right there, it states uh, 338, is that the extraction report that correlates with that particular phone? Yes, it is. So going through that, that um, extraction, um, the, same messages, the same messages are in this particular phone um, that have shown up in the report. If, if, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm just asking, how are, how are you certain that the Celebrite report that, that uh, you're looking at is the uh, Celebrite report from the extraction uh, that you did of that particular phone? Yeah, I mean, this is the, the phone there, the data that I had provided to Detective Ortiz um, is, is the file that this extraction report was created from. Do you recall the timeline of the phone? Is that in that report? The timeline of the... Can you be more specific? Uh, and I'm, I'm asking as far as the timeline from the extraction, uh, does it appear that all the activity begins uh, on a particular date, uh, March 26, 2021? Yes, it does. Around, I think it was 11 o'clock. And it appears that the um, messages on that phone also end on that same day. Is that correct? And all the information from that particular phone? Um, yes, it does. And I may look at states... Um, 
What is the machine name? So that's going to be um, the machine that actually performed the extraction. So that's going to be the, uh, the desktop in our lab okay. that did the extraction. So the next page has the device details that was pulled out of that phone. Okay, and what is, uh, I guess, an MSISDN number? Um, that's, don't quote me, I want, I want to say that has to do with the, um, the T-Mobile carrier information, a number that they would assign to the phone. Okay. And detected model, uh, that's a 5007W, is that correct? Uh, that would sense here. Uh, yes. Okay. And based on everything uh, that you've reviewed in uh, preparation for today, and uh, the cell phone that you have uh, seen here on state in states 316 that's already been admitted, and the cell phone report, uh, cell right report that you um, created in states 338, are you certain that the phone um, in states 316 is the phone that you uh, extracted to create the report in states 338? Yes. Your Honor, pass the witness. Cross examination of the record break. I don't have any questions. Here. <clears throat> All right, may I see uh, State's Exhibit 338? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, the State reoffers State's 338. Is there any, any, are you for all purposes? I'm sorry, 338 is for uh, record purposes and, and 339 and 340 for all purposes. Those are um, specific conversations out at States 338. Is there any objection? No objection at this time, Judge. For the purposes of the hearing or before the jury as well? For the jury as well. All right. Uh, then let's have the jury back in. And then we can go through this process again. We're ready, Mr. The state offered uh, state exhibit 338 for record purposes and then 339 and 340 for all purposes. Is there any objection? No objection, no. All right, then state exhibit number 338 is admitted for record purposes only, and 339 and 340 are admitted for all purposes. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, Detective, uh, 
And when you were looking at states 338 for uh, the entire cell bright uh, report that you ran on this, did it appear that all of the messages and activity from that phone took place on the same day? Yes. And what day was that? You recall? I believe it was March 26. Okay, 2021? 2021, yes. And um, you mentioned before that it appeared that that phone looked fairly new. Yes. Um, Your Honor, permission to uh, publish dates 339 and 340? You may. Now, we're going to look at states 340 uh, first, and the participants, so the, the messages on the right, who are those being sent from this device or being, um, I guess, received? Uh, generally, if they're they're on the right, they're going to be sent. Okay, and, and says, it, it says status. sent on the status. Yes, right there. Okay, and then the participant is Kyle. Now you don't know who Kyle is, but um, it does indicate that the user of this phone put that name in there. Correct. Correct. Okay, and it says this is my burner. Um, I'm turning off the other one so it doesn't ping. And then going down, it says so. And this would be looking at the second page of states 340. This would be the response, correct? Let's zoom out just a little bit. Uh, yes. Okay, and that appears to be from Kyle, correct? Correct. And it says, call me when you get a second. It should be on the road out of Dallas at 2, 2.30, waiting to fill Val script so she can, uh, so she good on the road, about to be on the road, taking the act seat out now, and that's at uh, 326 of uh, 2021 at 331 p.m. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Okay, and the response sent says, okay, great, I need you guys so we can use Val's debit card for these reservations. I'm feeling exposed. And that's at 3.46 p.m. Uh, on 3.26.21, correct? Correct. Uh, Kyle's response is, I know, I'm just now getting everything together, loading the car now. Uh, to which the owner of the phone responds, be careful, okay, be careful, don't speed, I really love you. You should be proud of Aaron and Chelsea. They came to me scared to death, but they came. And this is at now 4 p.m. Uh, on 3 Is that correct? Yes, it is. And uh, that's page 3 of States 340. Now, turning over to page 4 of States 340. And again, this is from this, the owner of the phone sending uh, to Kyle, Jim wouldn't do it, but he told them I was coming to their house every weekend. You are saving me for a minute. I don't feel bad for Jim. He can't help it. Somebody had to be Judas. And Kyle responds, it's Jim Fauchot. We're leaving just now. Grabbed the last of the stuff for the car. Uh, to which the sender responds, okay, cool. And then uh, page five of states 40, it indicates that the sender says, pray Nina signs the form. And that's at 428 on uh, 32621. Is that, is that right? Yes. Okay. And the last uh, message back, it says, I'm praying. And that's uh, the conclusion of this conversation. Is that right? Yes. Now, that's in States 340. Uh, you also uh, kind of isolated some messages between um, another contact in the phone. Is that correct? The, yeah, they are isolated. I didn't do them personally myself. Okay. Yeah. And I apologize. To be clear, yeah. 
Did you review that those both of these isolated, I guess, uh, text conversations? Yes. And did confirm that they were part of states 338, the entire Celebrate report? Yes. Okay. The second conversation, that's in states 339. Do you recall who the uh, the name of the participant um, in that conversation? Uh, well, Lover okay. is, is the main one you see there. Okay. And about what time does this uh, text conversation begin? Uh, uh, March 26th at uh, 2021 at 11.28 a.m. And it appears the center of the phone is saying, hey, love, we good? And then there's no response for some time. Um, and at 2.47 p.m., what is the response? I'm um, sorry, not guess, what is the response, what is the next message? Uh, guess, guess not with some periods after. Okay. On page two of states 339, does lover finally respond? Yes. And what does lover respond with? Uh, yeah. And, and then and then you with a question mark. Okay. Um, so then the message is, yep, uh, I'm still hanging out, and that's at 3.47 p.m., is that right? Yes. Okay, and then attorney, or A-T-T-Y, do you take that as a, a abbreviation for attorney? Yeah, I would. Okay. Yes. Attorney is seeing a wife today which um, lover responds okay and the response to that is I really wish we were together it's hard to wash your own back and that's at 356 p.m. is that correct yes and the next message is you can't trust anybody either and that's at 357 uh, p.m. is that correct yes okay Lover respond. What does lover respond with? Um, I know. Oh, I know. Love. And then, can you send me some money? I need to change vehicles. Okay. Um, to which the response is yes. As soon as I see the attorney, I had to pay him up front. Big gamble, but there didn't seem to be any issue as long as she signs off, and that's at 4:01 p.m. Um, is that right? Yes. And looking at. Uh, page four of states 339 um, it states I called the jail myself and what did lover respond uh, what they say they got warrants for capital murder on all three of us supposedly they found her and that message is at 403 p.m. but the attorney said they are building a case they don't have evidence. And then states, uh, I'm sorry, page five of states 339 says they are guessing. I'm hoping she keeps her shit together. I need to get out of this state real quick. How much money do you need? And what does Lover respond? Um, how much can you send? <clears throat> Page six of uh, states 339. Uh, I, I need T, T-I, maker moves. Okay. Um, it, and then make, so I'm guessing they're clarifying their, their, uh, their, their typo. correction typo, yes. Okay. Uh, to which uh, the response is, I have no idea how much there is until I get her shit. I'm trying to go to our fave spot. I wanted to live for a minute. You think you could get to me there? And then page seven of states 339. Or do I need to come get you? To which uh, lover responds. Uh, yeah, with an exclamation point. And then I thought you got paid today as a question. I did. This guy was 2000 to get the money off Nina he just called me. And what's Lover's response? Uh, what he say with a question mark? And this is going on from uh, 
4 p.m. and now we're at 5.16 p.m. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and then states, uh, page 8 of states 339. Um, lover sent a question mark and then the word mom with a question mark. And it looks like uh, the previous message, um, what did he say? Was it 5.16 p.m.? Is that right? Yes. And then there was a delay of about an hour and 15 minutes where there was no response. <coughs> Correct. And then uh, another hour and 15 minute or so response uh, delay where the question is mom. Is that the conclusion of that conversation? Yes. And did all messages and activity on that phone start and end the same day, and that's March 26, 2021? Yes. And just to be clear, all of these messages um, were messages from that T-Mobile phone that was seized uh, from the possession of Lisa Dykes uh, upon her arrest in Orlando. Is that correct? Yes, to my understanding. Okay. That's what you're on. Coffee, thank you. Thank um, you. Officer, I want to first talk about the, I guess the messages uh, from this Dyke's phone to Kyle. Um, in regards to that whole message stream, uh, would you agree it, it appears that she's trying to get him to assist her doing something? Uh, to my understanding of reading the messages, that's what it would appear to me. Right. And whether that something is uh, help her get back here to Texas so that she could turn herself in, you have no idea, correct? No, I was not um, involved in that part of the case. But you do know on, I mean, on, on, on both text streams, they're talking about having been in contact with attorneys. Would you agree with that? Yes, I agree with that. Getting money to pay attorneys. Would you agree with that? Yes. Um, and in reference to whatever communication she's having with Lover, uh, they're talking about being in communications with an attorney, aren't they? Yes. She says she called the jail. They have capital murder warrants out for us. Out for three people, is what she said, right? I don't remember if it said for three people, but I did see it said for capital murder warrants, yes. Okay. Uh, but again, she's making reference to contacting an attorney. Yeah, to my understanding, yes. In fact, uh, she specifically indicates that attorney is seeing wife today. You remember that? Yes. Okay. And do you know if this is uh, March the 27th, were you aware that she was arrested? on March the 27th of that year uh, while she was on the phone with her attorney? I'm, I'm not aware of any details of her arrest, no. Oh, that's good. That's all I have to Anything further? Just briefly, Your Honor. You um, You've done a, a lot of cell phone attractions, uh, things of that nature. What is a burner? 
a, well, burner just in, I guess, slang terms uh, in law enforcement field, it's usually a phone that you're just going to use for a, a very um, quick purpose that you'll probably get, a, get rid of pretty quickly as well. Something that you don't believe is tied to you. That's what it's wrong. Nothing further, Judge. May this witness be silenced? No objection, Your Honor. No objection from the state. Thank you, sir. You're free to leave and go back to prison. Please watch your step. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Judge. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the jury is now 4.15. We will go ahead and break for lunch. I expect you back in the jury room no later than 1.15 p.m. Please remember your instructions. All right.
Yeah, four. Paul Snyder, four. No, no. Paul Snyder, four. Uh-uh. You ever see Paul Snyder? Uh-uh. Yeah, yeah. Let me show you how amazing they are. Check, 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 one, one, check, check. So how are old people able to run those marathons? Because they ain't sitting down. Because they're, 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 they're training. They're training. That's what they're they're doing. training for. That's what it's all about. You got to train. They run at their own pace, though. So you didn't do the marathon this week. Hell no. Man, that marathon got me. I thought I was going to take a shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> you was out there? I was not out there. I was oh. at Kroger. 
trying to cut through. Trying you know? to through all this shit. Yeah. I think I cut it right at the it end, was though. Cold. But it was no. Yeah, no. See, both of yours, I ran it. It was cold. And my little well, ass, I had some I sweats on. Here, and uh, my dumb ass first year, I, I sat down because I was overheating in those damn sweats. About mile 21, sat down, try to pull them sweats out. She, yeah. Couldn't I get back up. Now. I got back up, but then now you're cramping. That's what I'm saying. Every other step was cramping. <laughs> you had anybody out give you water? Yeah, they need water, bananas, everything on the road, but what I'm saying is, because I was an inexperienced runner, yeah. I overdressed. You forget that you're going to heat up, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you forget you're going to heat up, so even in that cold, your body can sustain it, but I know that's out there to warm up something. Like, nope. Yeah. You didn't run track in high school? Hell no, yes, I play baseball. Was there anything else? Um, you make it to the MLB? No, I didn't make it to the MLB. I ran to the chapter to fix all that shit. But yeah, um, the PB? Well, you went PB my freshman year. Pray me.
may be seated. Ms. Pittman, please call your next witness, or Mr. Burns. Yes, Your Honor. The state would call Ms. Julia Lafayette. Come on up, Ms. Lafayette. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do, Judge. Thank you. You may be seated. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you please state and spell your name for the record? Sure. My name is Julian Lapierre. It's J-U-L-I-A-N-L-A-P-E-Y-R-E. And Ms. Lapierre, how are you currently employed? Um, I am currently a supervisor at the Dallas County Pretrial Services uh, Department. What is the Pretrial <coughs> Services Department? So basically, Pretrial Services uh, is a department where we run um, five different units. And what we do is we uh, assist the courts with supervising uh, defendants that are out on bond, uh, make sure they come to court. Um, there are different divisions within pretrial. So we have an intake division where they are um, working in the jail when folks are coming into the jail, interviewing them for their financial affidavits and their PSAs, stuff like that. Um, we have a general pretrial unit that works um, on low cost, cost county bonds for individuals that may qualify. Uh, and then we have a smart justice unit that does the same as the general uh, division but there's a mental health component. We also have an alcohol monitoring unit um, that supervises defendants um, that are legally um, obligated to have some sort of alcohol monitoring like an interlock device. The last unit that we have is the electronic monitoring unit um, and that unit supervises defendants that are out on bond um, who a judge orders to have that as a condition of being out of jail. Okay. And let's talk a little bit about that. What is an electronic leg monitor device? <clears throat> so, I, I do have some here, but um, an electronic leg monitoring unit is a GPS device that is installed on someone's, um, most, most of the time on someone's ankle. Um, and we are able to track every minute of every day um, where these individuals uh, go. Commissioner Bushar? You may. You said you brought a couple of devices that are kind of demonstrative aids? Yes. Is that what you brought right here with you right here? Yes. Do uh, you think these would aid the jury in understanding uh, your testimony as we kind of go through it? Sure. Yes. Um, and I'll just show the defense to make sure there's no issue with her using the demonstrative. Uh, uh, no objection. I've seen quite a few of them. <laughs> um, Commissioner, for the witness to use these as demonstrative during the testimony, Your Honor? Uh, and so, if you can, I mean, we can step down, I guess, with uh, one, one of these devices or both and just kind of talk about the actual devices <coughs> themselves first. Sure. You might step down so we can oh. just, just show this. A thing. show and tell, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, just keep your voice in. I'll do my best. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. I'm also very nervous, so. <laughs> um, walk us through what are we looking sure. at in these. So, usually there's not like a zip tie in here. Uh, usually what would be placed in here would be usually like pins, almost kind of like screws, um, but they're in there. There's a pin that comes on the top and there's a pin that is installed on the bottom and they lock in place within the device itself. Um, the device has a charging port, so a lot of people um, are curious, well, how do they charge their device? Do they take it off to charge? No. The device remains on the person at all times, it's just a very long charging cord that they have to plug in and they have to charge once a day for an hour at a time. You kind of have to think about it as a cell phone. So it does have GPS just like your cell phone, so you do have to charge it in order for it to work. Um, <clears throat> the um, band uh, is rather thick and, and uh, very rubbery, but inside there's fiber optic. So if a person were to cut the strap to remove the device, um, we would instantaneously get an alert telling us that the strap has been tampered with. If the pins were removed, there's also a sensor inside and a sensor in the back plate where um, that would also
also tell us that the device has been tampered with. And so, like you said, it's got a number of ways that if you were to try and remove the pens or mess with the strap, it sends what's called a tamper alert. Yes. Yes. Like I said, this strap here is a pretty sturdy strap that gets fitted on someone when they have to wear one of these. Yes. And so they're not allowed to ever take that strap off once it's on. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and then you just pop that off there, and that's where you charge. Yes, sir. And this other device that you brought just doesn't have a strap, but this was an older device? Yes, so that was, um, this is a, that is an older piece of equipment. It's actually the device um, that we were utilizing back in 2021. This is an upgraded version. But same features yes. in this that were in that. Yes, sir. Um, and it had the same similar strap as this one didn't come with a strap. Correct. Yes. And so you can sit back down. Okay. Uh, and you all aren't involved with who has a leg monitor. You said that's that's court ordered by a judge or a magistrate judge as well. Right? Correct, okay. yes. Um, and then <coughs> how does it work if someone uh, you know, makes their bond, they get uh, this order mm -hmm. to have a leg monitor, how do they end up uh, in your system and, and supervised by you? Sure, so um, if somebody posts bond and there is an order for electronic monitoring, um, there is a hold that's placed in the jail for them. So even though they've posted bond, they're not allowed, they're not released. Um, what happens is we get a list every morning of who's posted bond that has a hold for our division. Um, and we send um, employees over to uh, do an interview with them to make sure that they have stable housing, obviously. The concept is house arrest. You must have somewhere to live. Um, we also get emergency contact information and we um, do our due diligence if there are potential victims um, to make sure that there's a stay away, that they're not living with any victims in their case. Uh, we then go verify that address um, with the emergency contacts that we're given and then we place them on a release uh, email with the jail. Uh, the following day we do release and we go through an orientation and we go over their specific court order specific to that defendant and then they also go through an orientation with the monitoring company that we have a contract with and they go over kind of the details and the what to and what not to do with the monitor um, and then they're sent home. Um, and so once they're sent home, you said at first, I think you say that there's um, house arrest. Is that kind of the default option on the leg monitor? Typically, yes. Um, but it's possible to also have what's called work release. You can be able to go to jobs and get find a job and things like that. Correct, yes. Okay. Um, that's all dependent upon the judge, though. Yes. And very and case specific for individual. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and so, uh, do folks also then <coughs> have to report to the pretrial officer while they're on this? Yeah, yes, they do. And so um, often folks uh, do, uh, they think that we're hand in hand with probation. It's kind of the same thing. You're reporting to an officer, you know, ask, questions are asked, their equipment is inspected. Um, but yes, we do meet with them. And like you said, you get their contact information, and um, obviously it's house arrest, but if I need to go get groceries or medical care, I can, if I were a defendant, I'd be able to ask my officer, hey, here's where I need to go, am I allowed to leave? Correct, so the, the, the basic allowances are medical, legal, and necessity, which would be grocery shopping, going to Social Security, those kinds of things, yes. But, and, and that's a pretty, uh, or an attempt to make that an easy process where they've got an open line of communication with whoever their officer is, email, call, text. Yes, because they do have to get permission to leave their home. Now let's talk a little bit about this case. Did you uh, actually supervise uh, Miss Lisa Dykes and her wife, Nina Morano? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, do you remember when they uh, went on to the Lake Monitor program? Uh, yes, so um, Miss Morano actually was released first. Um, hold on, I get 
good title. Maybe I won't. I know it was April of 2021, but if you need the... So April 2021? Uh, yes. And then you said, and then Lisa, shortly after Ms. Brown? Yes, um, Ms. Dykes was released on May the 12th of 2021. Um, okay, and then you said they have to have stable housing. Yes. Where did they go live for first? Um, they uh, were residing with um, Kyle Williams, which I believe um, was Ms. Dykes' son. Okay. And did they eventually get their own house or they, apartment? They did. Do you remember about how quick? I would say a couple months. And... Um, Ms. Dykes and Ms. Morano, um, were they um, compliant with their instructions and with, with what they were supposed to do in terms of reporting and how they were to conduct themselves on the program? Yes, sir. They were very compliant. Um, they were very responsive, um, very cordial, respectful. Um, yes. How often would you interact with uh, the two of them? I would say... Um, at least once or twice a week, if not more sometimes, you know, via email or phone or in person, depending. And they seemed to understand exactly what the rules were and how this would work and how they could um, move about to accomplish those necessities that we talked about. Yes, sir. Okay. And they, they followed those rules for, for several months, isn't that right? Yes. Okay. Um, did you ever meet with them in person? Yes. Okay. Um, and I guess um, we kind of talked about it, too. Um, in meeting with them in person, uh, was there ever a complaint about one of the devices? Um, yes. Okay. Um, what, what was that complaint? About November of 2021, um, it was Miss Morano. Uh, she was complaining that her device was too tight on her ankle um, and wished for it to be loosened up a little bit. Um, unfortunately, I'm not, that's, that's really not my call. That's up to the monitoring uh, company. That's their device. Uh, I, you know, I have no um, training in, in installing devices, and so that I leave that call up to the monitoring company themselves. Did you ask someone from the monitoring company to come check out Ms. Morano's device? I did. Okay. And that's pretty standard for you? Yes. Okay. And did they check out the device? Yes, they did. What happened next? Um, they said that it was um, fine, meaning that they weren't going to loosen it. Um, however, uh, if you know if there was a reason that maybe Ms. Ronald's ankles would swell or whatnot, that um, for her to take pictures and to come back on Monday, because I, I do remember that this occurred on a Friday. And let me ask you this: Were, were Ms. Morano and Ms. Dykes reporting together at this time? Yes. Um, and so would Ms. Dykes have been at this appointment as well? Yes. How did Ms. Morano and Ms. Dykes respond to this information? Um, Ms. Morano actually started crying. Um, she was pretty upset. Um, and, you know, Ms. Dykes was just telling her, you know, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. So. In your interactions with the two of them, uh, could you ever tell you know, who would take the lead in communicating with you all? Um, or the lead in terms of how they would give information to you? They would both email about the same frequency, but in person, um, it did appear that Ms. Dykes was um, definitely a little bit more dominant. Ms. Morano was a little bit more quiet, a little more subdued. Okay. Uh, and so then we're at November 2021, there's some complaints that uh, the device is too tight, but uh, Sentinel says it looks fine. Yes. Was there ever any follow-up from Ms. Morano about the device uh, to get it off or to get it loosened back up? Yes, so they, they uh, she did report on Monday and they did um, end up um, reinstalling a device on her leg. So they accommodate and say, here, let's figure out a way to make this a little better. Yes, sir. And that solved the problem? Yes, sir. Um, now I want to kind of move to the next month, December of 2021. Um, have they, at this point, uh, they were still compliant um, in, in their performance on electronic leg monitor? Yes, sir. 
and uh, December 23rd of 2021, did they ask uh, to leave the residence? Yes. Okay. What was the request for on December 23rd? Um, the request was to go to um, a medical office for medical lab work and to go to CVS and Target. Was this for both of them or just one of them? Both of them. Um, would, pre would, would pretrial services have pushed back or asked anything further on that? No, not at that time. That was one of those check boxes, allowable things to go do? Yes, medical and necessities. So now let's talk, was there, and then a couple days later, uh, a, a report sent to the court? Yes, there was. Okay, what was that? Um, so, basically, um, I'm trying to gather my thoughts here. Well, let's, let's, let's start with this. Uh, obviously, December 25th, uh, Christmas, I think it was on, that was a weekend on 2021, is that correct? Yes, sir, it was a Saturday. <laughs> So 2021, Christmas is on a Saturday. Yes. Was the county closed that Friday, the I guess the 23rd? Or no. Okay. Was the county going to be open the following Monday? No, the county was closed that following Monday, the 27th. How does that work um, for pretrial services on those holidays? Obviously, people are still being monitored 24-7. Right. So um, our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30, um, which if there's a holiday, obviously, we're also celebrating that holiday and we're on vacation or off out of the office. Um, however, the electronic monitoring unit does have um, duty phones. And with those duty phones, um, we are on call 24 seven in, in a sense. Uh, if there is a tamper alert on any of these um, devices, a text message is sent to that duty phone and um, the duty officer would look into that um, tamper. Uh, oftentimes we're calling, we're emailing, we're texting, we're trying to figure out, you know, is it an accident or, or did this person truly abscond from supervision? Um, at that point, if we do believe that the person has absconded due to, to the tamper alert, they're not answering the phone, uh, you know, we call and we speak to their emergency contact and they say, yes, they're gone. Um, we file what's called an abscon notice. Um, since it's after hours, what we do is we reach out to our division um, in the jail, the intake uh, division, because they do work, shift work 24 seven. And um, we email that report to them, and then they go um, to an on-duty magistrate judge to request uh, insufficient bond warrants um, be activated immediately. So let's Break this down, but December 26th, yes. did you get, unrelated to this case, a uh, tamper alert? On, t on the 27th, I did. The 27th? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, and, um, but that was, again, unrelated to this case? Correct. Um, because you said those tamper alerts are kind of a special alert? Yes. And so you started to look into that, you took care of that case? Yes. What did you do next? So I was on duty. And I had taken care of that tamper alert, so I turned on my laptop and was emailing um, the abscon notice. And I noticed um, I noticed that um, both Miss Dykes and Miss Morano um, did not have any GPS on their devices. Um, it appeared that um, their devices simultaneously um, dis were disabled. Um, and when I looked further, one device went offline at 7.28 and the other device went offline at 7.32 a.m. on the 25th of December. So December 25th in the, the a.m. hours, those devices uh, stopped sending the signal? Yes, sir. Now does that send a tamper alert if I just send my device down? No. Um, but you said they both die within a couple of minutes of each other, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And how long have you been working with pretrial services, the leg monitoring division? Almost 11 years. Um, so you're pretty familiar with these devices and um, monitoring people on these devices? Yes, sir, I am. Okay. And um, 
obviously, you know, one way to have lost the GPS signal would be the device just dies. Is that fair? That's fair. Um, in your training experience, with I mean, how many people do you think that you've supervised over those 11 years? Thousands? Probably. And uh, in, in your training experience, do you have or do you believe that um, two devices could die within minutes of each other by just failure to charge? Um, it's it's very unlikely. Okay. Um, what is uh, an explanation that you know, based on your training experience working with these devices and monitoring folks, that could cause these devices to go off within moments of each other? Um, I would say it would be either physical damage to the device itself or submersion of water. Now, if I were to physically damage the device, would that send a tamper alert? It could, but it might not either. So it's possible if I, some blood force trauma could potentially not be so strong that it doesn't send a, a tamper. Correct. Um, but that's the point of the tamper alert, is that if I were to try and physically damage the device, that it should send a tamper alert. That's correct. But if I were to submerge my device in water, are they, are they water resistant at all? Um, so yes, yeah, so to an extent. Um, uh, defendants are told that they can shower with their devices, but they cannot take baths, go on the pool, in the hot tub. They cannot submerge their device in water. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's your belief that if you were to fully submerge the device in water, that they could do exactly what happened here, which is a couple minute apart, GPS service stops. Correct. Uh, and then what do you do? December 27th, uh, you see this. What, mm -hmm. what, what are the first steps to determine? You talked about calling folks. I did. I, I called both Ms. Dykes and Ms. Morano. I emailed them. And I then called uh, my manager um, and the assistant director, and I staff the case with them. And um, pause you there. You called Ms. Dykes and Ms. Moran. You had good working phone numbers for both of them. Yes. Did they answer? No. Did they call you back? No. You emailed. You had good communication via email. Did they email you back? No. Before this, had they ever complained that there were any electronic issues with these devices? No. Um, so you staffed it, and then you send what's called the abscond notice. Is that I right? do. I I send the abscond notice just like I did the first one that had tampered earlier that day. Um, and we were able to get insufficient bond warrants within four hours. Did you count, contact their uh, emergency contacts? I don't recall if I did or not. And the abscond notice is an actual report that you prepare and send to the court? This is correct, yes. Commissioner Hershey, you're on. You may. I'm going to show you what I've marked here. States 341. Mm -hmm. Staple it, but it's only actually on one page. I have two copies of this. States 341. Do you recognize that? Yes. Is this a copy of your abscond notice involving Miss Lisa Dykes and Miss uh, Murata? Yes, sir, it is. Lisa Dykes. Yes. And I'm going to show you states 342 is a almost identical report but involving Miss Morano. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, and then down here is kind of the subject of the, the report that you make that sends to the court about yeah. you. Oh. Yes. And then it has your name as the submitting officer on them? Yes. This time I'll offer states 341 and 342 for all purposes and can read the defense for any objection. No objection, Judge. All right, states exhibits 341 and 342. Are admitted for all purposes. And permission for the And so what we have here is states 341, abscond notice, like you said, up here at the top it says Lisa Dykes, is that correct? Yes, sir. And list out the case numbers and as which you are the ELM officer, is that correct? Yes. Here's kind of what you've already testified to. Is that right? Kind yes. Of just the basic of when the alarms go off. Yes, sir. 
we see 7.32 a.m. for Ms. Dykes and 7.28 for Ms. Moran, is that correct? Yes, sir. And then lastly, were you submitted on December 27, 2021? Yes. And December 27, 2021, that was that following Monday that was still a county holiday. It was. Everyone was still out of the office. And say it's 342 is almost identical, just to, that it's Ms. Morano's report and that we see the language reflects that in reading as well. Yes, sir. Someone cuts their leg monitor off. Uh, there could be a million reasons why they do that, right? You have no idea, right? No. Um, you just know it's a violation of the warrants going to be issued, right? That's correct. Um, Being the first person to cut the leg monitor off here in Dallas County, right? No, they're not, sir. Unfortunately, it happens far too often. Would you agree with that? I would agree. Um, how long were they on the um, monitor, if you recall? So, Ms. Morano um, was released in uh, April of 2021, and then Ms. Dykes was released in May of 2021. Um, so, you know, give or take six, six or seven months. Well, six or seven months? And yes, sir. Other than the complaints about the fitting of the device, uh, they pretty much did what y'all asked them to do, correct? Yes, they did. Okay. When you said that Mrs. Dykes was a little more Dominant than Ms. Morano. Um, what do you mean by that? Um, I just meant that a lot of times she would speak for the two of them, you know, in the office. Okay. You were like, she wasn't like aggressive with you. Oh, no, no, never, no. Okay. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Can you redirect? No, Your Honor. Ms. Lovier, be excused. No, Go back to work. Thank you so much. My name is Kathleen Nichols, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N-N-I-C-O-L-L-S. Okay, and uh, can you tell the jury what it is uh, that you do for a living? Yes, I'm a special agent with the FBI, and I am currently stationed in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. I'm the assistant legal attache, so working FBI matters in Cambodia. We cover Cambodia and Vietnam. And uh, as far as your 
duties in that position, can you just let the jury know uh, kind of just what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. Basically, any sort of U.S. nexus to uh, federal investigations, so anywhere from crimes against children to um, human trafficking for forced criminality, money laundering, and fugitive matters. Okay. How long have you been in Cambodia? I've been there since March of 2021, so just over two and a half years. And uh, how long have you been with FBI? Uh, over 17 years. Uh, can you give the jury, just uh, because it's a fascinating decision, a little bit of your uh, background and history uh, of what you do with FBI? Sure. Uh, I entered on duty in 2006. Uh, my first assignment was in Sacramento, California, working financial crimes. And after three years, I transferred to the Los Angeles Division of the FBI, where I was assigned to an organized crime squad, so worked transnational organized crime for several years. I've done a year and a half assignment at FBI headquarters, working also in the Transnational Organized Crime Unit, and I've also worked international corruption and um, Nigerian organized crime fraud money laundering as well before I moved to Cambodia with the FBI. And um, you said you've been there about two and a half years, is that correct? Correct. Um, so you mentioned that you work uh, work a lot of financial crimes, uh, human trafficking cases, things like that. Is that right? Yes. Um, from time to time, are you contacted uh, by um, maybe FBI task force members or FBI members here in the States concerning fugitives? Yes, that okay. is definitely part of what I've done. And uh, how often does that happen? In my uh, two and a half years, I've been contacted or we, I've dealt with three different um, murder fugitive cases. Okay. And uh, when we talk about murder fugitive cases, is it a federal crime to flee the states, the United States, uh, to avoid prosecution for murder? Yes, don't ask me what, I'm sure it's Title 18, <laughs> what United States Code it is, but yes, there is. Um, it's unlawful flight to avoid prosecution is the name of the statute. Okay. And so you are stationed in Cambodia. Are you aware of their, uh, I guess, extradition, extradition practices in Cambodia to the United States? Yes. So um, for your information, there's um, a lot of times when we're dealing with, at least with the FBI and federal law enforcement, in dealing with different countries, we, there are two things. There's a mutual legal assistance treaty, or also known as an MLAT, and then there's also often coincides with an extradition treaty. So um, every country will have a different relationship with the United States as far as MLATs or extradition treaties. Uh, in Cambodia, uh, there is no extradition treaty or mutual legal assistance treaty between, which is an agreement basically between the two governments. So there is no extradition treaty or MLAT between Cambodia and the United States at this time. So um, you said that you've worked on in your two and a half years there uh, three cases involving um, trying to apprehend murder defendants, people who have been charged with murder from the United States, is that correct? Yes, three different cases involving murders that took place in the United States and the individuals charged with that murder have fled and were in Cambodia. So at some point did you get, uh, were you contacted uh, by a local FBI agent um, regarding Lisa Dykes and Nina Murata? Yes, it was approximately January of 2022 when individuals from the FBI Dallas office reached out to me and said that there were two women, two individuals who were suspected of murder in the Dallas area and that uh, travel records indicated that they were currently in Cambodia. Okay, and so um, as far as Cambodia, you work in the capital city, is that correct? That is correct, yes. And, Phnom Penh is the capital of Cambodia. Okay, can you spell that for the for, for Sure, it's P-H, 
N O M, and the second word is pen, P E N H. Took me a while to learn <laughs> to spell that correctly. So, Phnom Penh is the capital city, and that's where the U.S. Embassy is located in the capital city of Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Uh, and so FBI Dallas contacts you and, and lets you know the travel records indicate that Lisa uh, Dykes and Nina Murata were somewhere within Cambodia, is that correct? Yes, they departed, according to the travel records from my recollection, departed on Christmas Day, December 25th, and flew through Seoul, South Korea, uh, through Anshan Airport, and then tra uh, flew into Phnom Penh. Okay, and uh, from your personal experience, how was that flight? It's long and grueling. <laughs> uh, if there's, at the time um, in question, uh, in January or December of 2021, uh, COVID was very real in Southeast Asia, and Cambodia had just lifted in December, early December of 2021. Cambodia was the first in the region to lift their quarantine. So during COVID, a lot of times, actually in that in Southeast Asia, many countries, had a long quarantine uh, period, whether it was 14 days, Cambodia lifted their from 14 to three days, and then it was early December when they lifted their quarantine restriction. Now, uh, at that time, was it a requirement, although they lifted the quarantine restriction, was it a requirement to have a negative uh, COVID test before travel to that country? I, I, recall, I do believe that's correct. I know um, there was also COVID testing upon arrival as well. So when I arrived in March of 2021, I had to have a negative COVID test before I left the U.S. and then also tested again upon arrival at the airport. So they were administering COVID tests at the airport. Now, when you received uh, this, I guess, call from the Dallas uh, FBI uh, requesting I guess assistance in locating Ms. Dykes and Ms. Morano. What steps do you have to take at that point? Sure. So um, one of the first things, so technically speaking, I don't have law enforcement authority in Cambodia. So we work very closely with local law enforcement in Cambodia. So one of my um, best partners, so to speak, in Cambodia is the Cambodia National Police. Also, we just refer to them as CNP. So the Cambodian National Police are partners in Cambodia. Um, it's actually a fairly unique uh, setup that we have where we have a, an official task force with CNP and also with the Immigration Department, so the General Department of Immigration. So we have an official task force where the FBI works very closely with the police and immigration. And this task force, are these the same individuals that you work with on a regular basis? That's correct, yeah. So our task force has about 10 Cambodian National Police officers. We have our task force leader is a 39-year veteran of the Cambodian National Police. Uh, he's worked a lot of cases throughout the years, human trafficking primarily, and has been a, a good partner with the U.S. Embassy altogether, but specifically with the FBI. I've worked very closely with him in the task force for um, my time in Cambodia. Now, um, after receiving this request, uh, you talked about working in, in conjunction with the uh, task force, the Cambodian National Police Task Force. Uh, what, what steps do you have to take at that point? Sure. So typically what will happen when we get um, information from a field an FBI field office that will either write a formal letter or sometimes it's an email or just a phone call stating that we've got a particular case that I've been made aware of. Uh, in this particular case, FBI Dallas contacted me and so then I would have contacted the, or I contacted the task force leader and explained the situation that we had two subjects that were um, charged with murder in the United States and so requesting their help in locating the two individuals. And uh, of course at that point, or is that the point when you all start uh, doing your work to kind of locate these individuals? 
Yes, that's correct. Okay, what tools, uh, what things did you all do to try to locate this bag from the Toronto? So working with immigration, we wanted to verify that um, the travel records, the flight records, indicated that they did fly into Cambodia, but we also wanted to check Cambodian immigration records to make sure that they hadn't departed Cambodia uh, moving on elsewhere. So we worked with the immigration department to confirm that they at least officially were still in Cambodia. Then we also received information from uh, Bank of America that they were using, um, Lisa and Nina were using their Bank of America ATM cards at various banks uh, in Cambodia. Is there a particular, uh, I guess, Cambodian national bank that has a lot of different uh, ATM um, outlets, if you will? Sure. So there, there are several different banks throughout Cambodia. The biggest bank, the most popular bank, is known as Advanced Bank of Asia, or for short, ABA. So ABA Bank is one of the most uh, popular banks throughout Cambodia. It's located in the capital city as well as throughout in various provinces throughout Cambodia. And um, did you all, you said throughout Cambodia, uh, were there some other uh, cities and locations in Cambodia that might be spots that you uh, might locate them besides the capital city that I don't want to try to say? <laughs> sure. So when um, first looking at some of their bank records, the, there was, we did see a transaction for the Courtyard Marriott so I had gone to, the, which is located in Phnom Penh, in the capital city. So uh, Courtyard Marriott was able to confirm that both Lisa and Nina had checked into the Courtyard Marriott and were staying there, but they were no longer there. So the bank records indicated that there were some ATM tra transactions. I believe there were some other transactions as well, but we were tracking, we meaning FBI Dallas, as well as um, myself and with the task force, tracking ATM transactions in a town called Sihanoukville. I can spell that for the, for the court. Yes, please. S-I-H-A-N-O-U-K-B-I-L-L-E. There's a lot of activity in Sihanoukville these days. It's, um, without going, there's a lot of human trafficking for forced criminality. Um, that's happening in Sihanoukville, a lot of fraud compounds, a lot of fraud victims in the United States and around, around the world. So Sihanoukville has um, become well known uh, in the human trafficking fraud. But back in 21, 20, early 22, um, Sihanoukville used to be a sleepy coastal town and it's developing more as Chinese organized, there's a lot of Chinese organized crime that's there but it is um, on the coast of Cambodia. Uh, I should know my geography and tell you what sea it is that's right there. It, I, think, I believe it's the Sea of Thailand that is on the coast of Cambodia. But Sihanoukville is a port city. Uh, there is a large port there as well. Okay, and so as you mentioned back in, uh, in 2022, uh, January 2022, this is more of a sleepy coastal town versus uh, what it's kind of turned into. The uh, at, in 2022, the casino, a lot of casinos were built. They were half built. A lot of the, the construction started, but then uh, with COVID, there didn't, not a lot was happening for a while. In 2021, they were very strict with COVID. Uh, similar to how things were shut down here in 2020, things were shut down in 2021, actually, in Cambodia so that a lot of the construction halted. Uh, so still developing at that point, or half developed, I would say, probably in early 2022. Okay. Now, uh, so you locate some ATM withdrawals and bank records that are indicating that there's some ATM withdrawals in that town. What do you do uh, next? So we see the financial transaction showing that there are ATM withdrawals in Siamakville. So uh, my task force leader and two of my task force officers, we travel. It was at the time, it took about five or six hours to get from Phnom Penh to Sienaville uh, in trying to locate uh, Lisa Dykes and Nina Morano. 
So we arrive in Sienaville, we meet with the provincial police there, just to kind of explain that we were from Phnom Penh and explain just um, face to face what, um, what our purpose was, why we were in Sienaville and uh, the, the goal of our, our mission there was to, to locate uh, Lisa Dykes and Nina Morano and take them into custody. Uh, after meeting with uh, the local law enforcement there in Santa, Santa Phil, is that clear? Sienna Phil. Sienna Phil. In Sienna Phil. Um, what, what did you do all after uh, you met with them? Sure. So, um, kind of feeling like we were looking for a needle in a haystack, um, just, or there were multiple ATM machines throughout Sienna Phil. So uh, one of the things that uh, I thought we would do is start with, there were a couple of hotels in the area that were um, more friendly towards Western, Westerners. So I thought maybe we would um, you know, try to find and see if they were staying at one of those hotels. So the one hotel that, the first hotel, um, typical FBI investigations, we would ask to talk to a manager uh, unfortunately, the hotel manager wasn't available. This would have been in uh, approximately around February 24th of 2022, 23rd of 24th. And so met with the, the hotel manager wasn't available, so uh, they said that I could meet with the front desk manager. So I met with the front desk manager along with my two task force officers and the task force leader. So explain why we were there, that we were looking for two individuals. Um, I had pictures of both Lisa Dykeson and Morano, so I showed pictures of them, and they didn't look familiar to the hotel manager. I shared with the hotel manager, or the front desk manager, uh, their um, passport numbers, as well as phone numbers that we had for them at the time. The front desk manager, ran through their system, the hotel system, uh, their database, didn't find anyone with the names. Well, I think we ran Lisa, Joe Dykes, and Nina Morano also with the last name of Beltran. Uh, we ran those names, or the front desk manager ran through the database, didn't find anything. And we had said that we, um, I had shared in my conversation that we had some bank transactions, uh, ATM withdrawals in Sienokville. And the hotel manager said, well, we've got a very good relationship with the ABA bank manager. Uh, again, ABA being the biggest bank in Cambodia, also the largest bank in Sienokville as well. So the hotel... So, let, let me just stop you right there for just a second. So you're talking to the hotel manager, and he is letting you know that he has a good connection with the ABA bank. Um, in Cambodia, and someone that can kind of help you out with uh, getting some information about the ATMs. Is that correct? correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, you mentioned that you ran, uh, you had him run the names Lisa Dyke and Nina Morano through their uh, tracking system or their record system at the hotel. Is that correct? Yes. And also Beltran. Is that right? Yes. And what? Why did you use Beltran as well? So I, I, at some point, I had seen um, a document where they were that Lisa and Nina had changed their last name to Beltran, so that they were married and that they had officially gone through a, a name change, as well as their passports that they used to enter Cambodia. They used their passports had the last name of Beltran. Okay. Now. Uh Let's talk more about the uh, hotel manager that got you in connection with the ABA manager of the, uh, the National Bank of Cambodia. Uh, were you able to contact this person and uh, get some leads about where to find Lisa and Nina? Yes, so um, we finished our meeting with the hotel manager, or the front desk manager at the hotel, and my task force leader then contacted the ABA bank investigator or the bank manager, and that was about 4.30 in the afternoon, and um, we, my task force leader left his name and phone number, and at somewhere between 8 and 9 o'clock that night, 
uh, my task force leader contacted me and said that the bank manager had located the two women. And uh, how were they able to locate the two women? So looking through bank surveillance footage, they were able to identify the transaction. So they had pictures, they sh and the bank manager shared with our task force leader pictures of both Lisa and Nina accessing the ABA ATM. And then also they were able to zoom out to the parking lot of that bank where they were using the ATM. And they identified, I believe it was a red Toyota SUV. I think it was a forerunner, but I'm not sure. So it was a red Toyota SUV that pulled into the parking lot of the bank and the driver got out and then opened the door for Nina and Lisa to exit the vehicle and then go access the ATM. Um, so what steps did you take after that, after seeing that bank uh, surveillance footage in the red Toyota forerunner? So we were able to positively identify both Lisa and Nina and also able to zoom into the license plate on the red uh, SUV. And so once we were able to get the license plate from the vehicle, then at that point worked through, it wasn't me, it was my uh, task force officers working through their police system and identifying the registered owner of the vehicle. Once they identified the owner of the vehicle, they, the, it was the next morning when my task force officers contacted the owner of the vehicle, who we found out was a taxi driver. And so we were able to get in contact with the taxi driver, asked the taxi driver, I wasn't part of the conversation, it happened in the local language of Khmer, but I was told by 8.30, or maybe it was even I, don't, I can't remember if I found out the night before or the morning of that um, they had been in contact with the taxi driver. The taxi driver said that, yes, he had take, picked up two Westerners, two Western females, and had taken them to the bank. So we knew that at least the taxi driver was able to tell us a little bit more information. Now, uh, what size of a coastal town is the end of the bill? <laughs> Sienaville. Um, I, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the Dallas area, so I can't uh, equate it to. Um, it, it's a pretty small town, though. Uh, there's a. It, I would say the population is half Cambodian and at this point half Chinese, also, but a, a pretty small town. Okay. Um, Ten thousand people. Mm, maybe fifteen or twenty thousand. Okay, about twenty thousand people. Now, uh, we, you all were able to contact the taxi driver, um, and uh, your uh, task force was able to verify that they picked up two uh, Western women that appeared to be Lisa Dykes and uh, Nina Morano. Uh, what did you? What all did you do next? So we had asked the taxi driver to. We were staying at a local hotel, and so we had asked the taxi driver to meet us. When I say us, it was myself and a translator that works for my office in, in at the U.S. Embassy in Phnom Penh. Uh, so the two of us and then my three task force officers. So initially the taxi driver said yes, that he would come to the hotel to meet us. Then he got a little nervous, realized that it was he didn't really want to be involved in a police investigation. So he, at that point, refused to come to the hotel to meet with us. However, he did say that um, on more than one occasion that he had picked up uh, the two women and had taken them to the ATM. So he was able to direct us to the house where they were staying. Uh, so he kind of directed us into the general vicinity of the house where he had picked, picked them up to take them to the bank. And so um, you're working with your task force and also with local law enforcement, is that correct? Yes, so um, the national police, there's the national level, and then there's also Cambodian national police that work in the provinces. So um, each province will have a commissioner and a deputy commissioner, but typically 
the national police from Phnom Penh, from the capital city, have a, I don't know, have, have a little bit more power, I guess, so to speak, over the provincial police. Um, but we work together uh, on several cases that I worked in different provinces. Uh, myself with the task force go to the province, we meet with the provincial police, and then they often provide resources, meaning personnel, to help us with whatever the case may be. Okay. And uh, in this case, um, they provided those resources. Did, did a group of your task force and also some of the provincial uh, police of that uh, area travel to the location that the taxi driver described? Yes, so once we had the general vicinity, um, I believe the description was two or three yellow houses sat next to each other, so where he had gone to pick up the, the two women. So we went to the general vicinity, we actually saw a group of two or three yellow houses that met the description, uh, came in contact with, there was a, about a, a young boy that was outside, the task force officers had asked the boy if he had seen two Western women, and he said no. At that point, uh, we contacted the taxi driver again, said, we're here at this location where you told us to go, uh, and he said, well, if you go up the hill and turn right, that we were actually at the wrong house initially. So then we were able to, um, my task force, I stayed back, my task force went looking for another group of uh, two or three yellow houses next to each other, and there was um, a young Cambodian man who had come out and made contact with my task force officers and said that his relative owned a house right down the street and that there were two Westerners, two women, that had been staying at the house for about a month at, at that point. So when my task force officer showed this Cambodian man copies or pictures of the two women, he positively identified the pictures as the two women that were staying at his relative's house. And so, I mean, this, I guess at this point, just coming across this young man, um, that was pretty lucky. <laughs> yes, it was, it was very lucky. Uh, the fact that the taxi driver remembered um, the house, the general vicinity, and then literally just like the, the saying someone came out of the woodwork was kind of how we felt that this young man had come out um, and voluntarily was just helping law enforcement. Uh, were you able to locate the uh, house uh, where these two women were renting from? I guess was it his aunt? I believe it was his aunt. I know it was a relative of his. Uh, were you able to locate that house? We were. So um, he took the my task force officers, and I was in a car behind. And we had ta taken um, he had taken my task force officers to and showed the exact house where they were staying. Uh, what happened next? <laughs> So at that point, we were fairly confident that we had the house where uh, Lisa and Nina were staying. Um, but before we did anything else, they wanted to talk to the local prosecutor. So the deputy commissioner contacted the local prosecutor, so a Cambodian prosecutor in Sihanoukville. And the prosecutor came out, uh, the task force, my task force leader and the deputy commissioner from the province explain the situation to the prosecutor. At that point, um, I got a call from the task force leader and uh, I was told that the prosecutor wanted to talk to me as well. Okay, uh, did you speak with the prosecutor? I did, so we were at this point standing outside about um, four houses down from the house where Lisa and Nina were staying and I explained to the prosecutor, I had showed him a copy of the uh, Texas state arrest warrant for murder, as well as a copy of the federal arrest warrant for, we call it a UFAP warrant, unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. And there was also what is, um, what law enforcement re refer to as an Interpol red notice. So a red notice is a um, 
viewed internationally um, through Interpol, respected agency that works with law enforcement in almost every country that I've worked with in the past. So, and it's basically just a notification that there is an arrest warrant in a particular country that these individuals are wanted in, in a particular country. So I was able to show the prosecutor a copy of the red notice along with the federal and state arrest warrants for both Lisa and Nina. And upon, uh, after that conversation, uh, were you able to proceed forward? Yeah, at that point the prosecutor authorized the law enforcement officers to go to the house and to execute an arrest um, to take them into custody. And how did, uh, how was that arrest, uh, I guess, uh, commenced? Sure. So um, this was on February 25th and uh, the Lisa and Nina had visas to um, reside in Cambodia, and if I recall correctly, their visas expired the next day on February 26th. So initially, the law enforcement officers, from what I was told, uh, because I was still four, about four houses down with the prosecutor, when the law enforcement officers, and to give you an idea, we had, there were four or six law enforcement officers that had gone in tactical gear. They were in green uniforms that looked similar to um, so tactic, tactical uniforms. And then there were probably three or four Cambodian police officers that were in their standard um, police uniforms. Then my three task force officers were in plain clothes. So it was those law enforcement officers that had gone to the residence and then called Lisa and Nina out of the house from what they had talked about doing was saying that they were there for an immigration check. And that's very common, the FBI, we do this all the time. We try, our goal is to call people out of the house. It's much safer than trying to just, not quite what you see in the movies. <laughs> um, we want people to come out of the house on their own. So um, I believe Nina was the first one to come out, but then Lisa also came out of the house. At that point, uh, when Nina and Lisa uh, come out of the house, and if, if I understood you correctly, there's four officers in tactical gear, so like SWAT team attire. Correct. And then four uh, just kind of plain, regular officer attire, and then your task force is in uh, plain clothes, correct? Yes. So at least eight police officers, or clearly visible police officers, um, at that home. Um, what happens after they come outside the house? So when they came out of the house, um, there must have been some sort of confusion because at that point the task force leader had asked me to come up to the house. So I walked just a few houses up. Um, so I'm now in front of the house with Lisa and Nina. I identified myself, I told them that uh, that I was with the FBI and that they were under arrest uh, for murder in the state of Texas and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. So I told them and I was able to give them clear, distinct commands similar to how I was taught at Quantico um, in training to put their hands behind their back and at that point they, the Cambodian National Police officers uh, put handcuffs on them and once they were in handcuffs, uh, one of the first things that Lisa, actually not one of the first things, Lisa looked at me and said, what jurisdiction do you have here? I was taken back by that comment, um, and, but at that point, I just responded to her saying that the Cambodian National Police Office, that we would have, that she and I would have time later to discuss, and I can explain things further, but at that point in time that the Cambodian National Police officers had to do their jobs. How did you take that comment? Like I said, I, I, was, I was taken back. It was not something, um, I mean, technically, I don't have law enforcement authority, but I wasn't the one doing the arrest. It was the Cambodian National Police, the numerous Cambodian National Police officers that I was with, so I was definitely surprised and, and taken back by that comment. 
Uh, I would imagine in your years in, in the FBI, it takes a little bit to, uh, to I guess, shock you or, or surprise you. I've been through a lot, and this was definitely something that, uh, I mean, it has stuck with me. Yes, it was, it was very surprising. And now, um, the Cambodian National Police uh, placed them under arrest, and as part of that arrest, uh, it's a little bit different, I guess, than here in the United States. They were in this home. Did they, did the police with Lisa and Nina go through the home and um, I guess identify what their personal items were, what things should go, what things should stay? That's correct. So the police officers went into the house and with Lisa and Nina and identifying, because they were renting the house from a Cambodian, uh, so they were identifying all of the articles and items that belonged to Lisa and Nina that the police were going to uh, gather and take with them. And uh, so did the police, I guess, al allow them to take some of their personal luggage, clothing, things of that nature? Yes, that is correct. There were clothes, there were phones, um, computers, some laptops, uh, I believe thumb drives, a couple of binders of miscellaneous documents that were all taken by the police. Um, and similar to what we would do if we were executing a search warrant in the United States, um, we inventoried everything, so they made a list of everything that was um, taken from the home that belonged to Lisa and Nina. I, I can tell you um, something else that was interesting. Um, that I'm going to object. You want to turn the air there, but I'm going to wait for the next question. You have to wait until you're asking a question. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, what was one of the other things that you found interesting? There, the amount of cash. So because the ATM transactions had indicated that they had gone to the bank several days um, before, prior to this encounter, this arrest, uh, so they had cash with them. Uh, unfortunately, some of the Cambodian National Police thought that they would help themselves to some of the cash, um, but uh, Lisa and Nina were very um, careful when they were going through every item that was taken that belonged to them, and when the Cambodian police came to the cash and said it was about $300. I believe it was Nina who said, no, no, that's not right. There should be close to $6,000 there. And sure enough, um, my translator had heard from, uh, overheard two of the police officers say, dude, put it back. So one of the Cambodian police officers did try to take the cash. But I guess my point is that they were very careful about each item that was taken that belonged to them. Um, whether the phones, uh, the there was also in the the money as well, and the computers and the binder of miscellaneous documents, and then there were two suitcases also where they had taken some of their clothes as well. Um, now, so you were there when this property was seized, is that correct? Yes. And then um, it. I guess went into your possession, which you then transferred it to uh, an FBI uh, Dallas uh, member. Is that correct? So the all of the of everything that was taken, we would just refer to all of it as evidence at that point in time, was um, taken by our my task force leader. So he had everything in his possession, and where our task force is. There's, we've got a couple of cabinets that are locked. So once, the, I think the suitcases were not locked. They were just in his office, the suitcases with clothes in them. I actually think they may have been able to take some of the clothes with them because they went to a um, hospital detention center for a short time because they both tested positive for COVID. So, but the, um, all of the, the phones, the money, the computers, in the documents would have stayed with the task force leader um, locked in a cabinet until the FBI Dallas agents came to do the transport to transport Lisa and Nina back to the United States and at that point then the transfer of custody from the evidence went from the task force leader directly to Special Agent Taylor Page with the FBI here in Dallas. You mentioned that um 
at some point they tested positive and that when did they test positive for COVID? So at the house um, after they were taken into custody and we, we had all gone into the house because I was with them just kind of trailing the task force officers and the other Cambodian police officers. <clears throat> and at some point, one of my task force officers stepped outside to administer a COVID test to Lisa and Nina, and they both tested positive. So at that point, we all kind of stepped back a little bit. Um, we're a little bit more careful with our masks and with hand sanitizer. Uh, so, um, but then after that, we knew that the search had to continue. So the officers went back into the house and um, continued their search and identifying all the items that belonged to Lisa and Nina. Okay. And um, they were transferred to a hospital um, <clears throat> slash detention facility there that that house, that in in Phil, <laughs> yes. So uh, bec the our original plan was to take the two Jim, individuals in. Object to being non-responsive. You almost answer the question. Sustain. Answer your next question. Okay. Were they transferred to a hospital detention facility there in Sienaville? That's correct. Once they once um, the police officers finished at the house and itemized um, all of the. Um, individual pieces of evidence and Lisa or Nina signed for it and then they were transferred to a local hospital, part of the hospital that they had turned into kind of the jail um, for individuals who had tested positive for COVID. Okay, at that point did you return to your, uh, the U.S. Embassy um, in the capital city? We stayed, the, we, the um, three task force officers, myself and the translator, we did stay um, at the hotel for a couple of days because we had been exposed to COVID and I didn't think it was fair for me to send my task force officers home to their family and ex possibly expose them to COVID also. So we stayed at the hotel for a couple of days um, just to make sure, and then we all tested um, for COVID, tested negative, and then tra traveled back to Phnom Penh. And then uh, you waited some days until, uh, I guess, you received uh, confirmation that Lisa and Nina were negative for COVID? Yeah, so we were told by the police in the hospital that they would test after one week. And after one week, I believe Lisa tested negative and Nina still tested positive. Excuse me. <coughs> So the task force, two, a few of my task force officers went to CNFL and then transported Lisa back to Phnom Penh to the Immigration Removal Center. And then within a few days, they tested Nina again. And once she tested negative, then she too was taken by my task force officers from CNFL back to Phnom Penh to the Immigration Removal Center. And... Once they uh, were in the immigration removal center, what steps have to be taken before uh, they will be deported or transferred back to the Dallas area? So the FBI, so I would have written a letter, either myself or my boss would have written a letter to both the immigration department, general department of immigration, as well as the Cambodian National Police, requesting that they be deported. Once uh, that letter is written, um, what happens next? Yeah, the Cambodian government does the checks that they need to um, in order to um, just lawfully, according to their laws and procedures, deport individuals. So they, a couple of the steps that are taken is that their visas would have been revoked. Um, that would have been done by the General Department of Immigration. So their visas were revoked and therefore they were in Cambodia illegally. The, their passports also were revoked. Their U.S. passports were revoked. That's a um, standard State Department consular services um, procedure. So to prevent them from being able to travel um, internationally. So their passports, which were part of the items that were taken, 
uh, the Cambodian, I'm sorry, the U.S. State Department had asked for their passports, so we had to get their passports and then turn those passports into the State Department that's located within the embassy compound where, where my office is as well. So although uh, there is no extradition treaty between Cambodia and the United States, uh, there are certain circumstances where people will be deported, is that correct? Yes, for sure. So technically, they were not extra, Lisa and Nina were not extradited back to the United States, but they were deported. And uh, had they had any, I guess, Cambodian ties, uh, familial ties, things, things of that nature, would that have resulted in a different uh, circumstance? Yes, if by Cambodian law, if they or their constitution. If they were somehow Cambodian citizens, then they would not have been deported in this case because Lisa and Nina had no known family ties to Cambodia and they were believed to be fully only United States citizens. That's why they were deported. All right, so um, Special Agent, you had uh, mentioned earlier that Several items were seized, several personal items were seized from uh, Lisa Dykes and Nina Morano upon their arrest. Um, and you were present for that and, and saw those <coughs> items being seized. Uh, did we have an opportunity to meet yesterday and go through uh, some of the documentation and items that were seized? Yes, we did. Okay. And uh, you verified that these items were uh, indeed in the uh, collection um, that were seized and, and put in that cabinet that you described to the jury and then eventually transferred to Special Agent Taylor Page. That's correct. May I, may I approach your honor? You may. All right, we have a, a, a load of stuff. Um, we're going to sh I'm showing what's been marked states uh, 343. And do you recall this uh, bag of items? Yes. Okay, and, and it appears just to be various identification items and things of that nature. Correct. There are some social security cards and some driver's license, and I believe it looks like one passport card. Yes. And it states uh, 344. Does that appear to be a passport uh, for... Yes, this is a passport for Nina Tamar Beltran. Okay, and states uh, 345. Will be an additional passport for Yes, this um, both passports are one way, um, one tr one transport. Uh, passports. This one is for Lisa Beltran, in the name of Lisa Beltran. Okay, Lisa Beltran. And uh, that states uh, 345. Um, states 346. Does that appear to be uh, one of the flash drives, USB drives that uh, was seized? Yes. <laughs> and states 347. Appears to be several SIM cards that were seized. Yes. Page 348, you recognize uh, this phone and a charger and a phone in a clear case? Yes, there were several phones that were seized, and this definitely appears to be one of them. Okay. States uh, 349, you had an additional phone that was seized? Yes. States 350, uh, this appears to be a group of phones uh, that were seized? Yes. And uh, these items also have an indication, like an FBI number as well on them, besides just the other packaging, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, Space 351, does that appear to be the uh, notebook that was seized um, with some documents inside? Yes. Okay. Just before you go on, this oh, yes. one package uh, is not the typical FBI packaging, um, so... I do remember the purple phone and the blue Motorola, so I do believe that these are the same phones. Okay, let's uh, just open States 350. And 
so we have a collection yes. of five different yeah. poems. Yes. And you recall, um, you said each of these, this is a white, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce yeah. that, but <laughs> pull yes. away phone, and then a blue mm -hmm. Motorola phone, a purple iPhone, a gray iPhone, and then uh, I guess a cream colored um, off-white iPhone. Yes. Okay. And that's all in states 350. Uh, 351, do you recognize that uh, binder? Yes. And it states 352, this appears to be three laptops that were seized. Do you yeah. recall that? Okay. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, we state offer states 343 through 350. 352? 352. 352 for all purposes. No objection. Right. Case exhibits 343 through 352 and the items contained therein are admitted for all purposes. Now, uh, Special Agent Nichols, that's not all that was uh, seized. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. There was some additional documentation um, that was seized as well, and we'll go through those items. So we're just going to flip through these quickly. You don't have to describe them just yet, but uh, do you recognize states 353? Yes. 354? Yes. Stays 355? Yes. Stays 356? And 357? Yes. Do you recognize states uh, 358? Yes. Um, states 359? Yes. And states 360? Yes. Stays 361? Yes. Uh, states 362? Yes. States 363? Yes. 364? Yes. 365? Yes. 364? Yes. 374? Yes. Uh, states 375? Yes. 376? Yes. Uh, states 377? Yes. States 378? Yes. States 379? Yes. States 380? Yes. Uh, states 381? Yes. And states 382. Do you recognize all those items? Yes. Um, Your Honor, state offers uh, states. Where did I start? 353 through 382 for all purposes. No objection, Judge. All right, states exhibit 353, paper documents through 382 are admitted for all purposes. Permission to publish some of those items, Your Honor? Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, the first, uh, I guess, item that I want to talk about is uh, the contents of this notebook in States 351. Now you, uh, us, you, I, and uh, Mr. Brown were able to meet yesterday and kind of go through some of these things um, prior to your testimony. Is that correct? Yes. And what does it appear that uh, this notebook contains? Primarily LLC uh, documents. Okay. And what was the business um, all that was this LLC? The one name is BN, BNB Enterprises LLC, which I believe is an abbreviation. There's, I think there's another document that actually says what BNB stands for. It's another LLC document. <coughs> Uh, 
there's another LLC membership certificate that's Boar and Bunny Enterprises LLC. Okay, so Boar and Bunny Enterprises LLC. And uh, does it indicate on there, uh, in this notebook, when that LLC was uh, initially started? I think there's a couple different LLCs, but the date on this document is August 5th of 2021. The date on this certi certification of members is the 8th of August, 2021. Another LLC resolution to open a bank account, also dated August 5th of 2021. And, uh, here's another uh, the certification of member, which is dated the 24th of September, 2021. There are also IRS documents under BNB Enterprises, Lisa Beltran, sole member. And so, based on that notebook, it does appear that, that they uh, went through all the proper um, steps to create an LLC, um, get an employee identification number through the IRS, and, uh, you know, all of those steps uh, after being initially arrested for um, the murder of Maricela Botello in March of 2021. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, in States 343, this was the uh, various identifications of both Miss, both Miss Beltrans, uh, Nina and Lisa, correct? And we'll start with Nina. Uh, Here's this uh, Utah identification is, is much, much older. That looks almost uh, about the time period that my original driver's license was issued, where they typed out instead of uh, having the digital print. Um, and it appears that she has uh, a passport card with the name Lisa, I'm sorry, Nina Tamara Beltran. If we can zoom in, can you uh, tell the jury when that card was issued? The passport card in the name Nina Tamar Beltran was issued on December 11th, 2020. And then uh, here is a Pennsylvania driver's license. What uh, is the issue date for that? The Pennsylvania driver's license, also in the name of Nina Tamar Beltran, was issued December 12th, 2020. And this particular New York State driver's license uh, indicates that there's an Orlando, Florida address um, and the issuance date, issuance date of 2014. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And as far as Lisa Beltran, um, have both her some social security cards with uh, Lisa Dykes, Lisa Ahmed, and then finally a Lisa Beltran. Yes, that's correct. Okay, and then we have this uh, Texas driver's license um, that it appears to expire in May, uh, May 25th of 2022. Correct. And then uh, we have a Pennsylvania uh, state driver's license uh, that was issued 
December 12th of 2020. Is yes. That, you're correct? Yes. Okay. Now, we did not have a, I guess, corresponding uh, United States of America passport card for Lisa Beltran. Uh, do you know why that is? I believe it was taken with when um, the consular service at the U.S. Embassy had asked for the passports for both Lisa and Nina, and so I'm pretty sure that I recall a passport card for Lisa being turned into the consular service, and I probably should have turned this one in also because it's a passport card, but it must have been stuck to another card, as, um, which is why it wasn't turned in also. Okay, so it just appears that this one probably got missed. Correct. Uh, and you're understanding the passport card and the actual passport itself, are they going to have the same issuance date? They, yes. Okay. As far as I know, they should have the exact same issuance date. Now, in uh, states 345 and 344, and we will look at states 345. This is uh, Lisa Beltran, or also Lisa Dykes, passport. Um, Can you just kind of describe to the jury, you said it was a, a one-use passport or one-way passport. What is that? Yeah, from what I've experienced and what I've been told by the consular services uh, in cases like this, um, all of their official passports are turned into consular service, but then they need a passport to actually travel from, in this case, from Cambodia back to the United States, so the consular services in coordination with Washington, D.C., issues a one-way um, passport for the travelers. Okay, and so this is a, a photo <coughs> of uh, Lisa Dykes from Cambodia, is that correct? I believe sometimes I've had experiences where the individual refuses to get their picture taken, um, but I do believe that this was taken in Cambodia. The consular services will go out and take a standard visa or passport photo with the typical white background and the right size. Now, going through some of these documents um, that were located during that seizure, this is states 353 and, I'll read the Cambodia, and I'm sure, I, I apologize, what is this, the local language? Uh, it's Khmer, it's spelled K-H-M-E-R, so phonetically would be Khmer, but it's most often pronounced Khmer. So it's the Khmer language, they refer to the Khmer people being can local Cambodians. Uh, Apsara is a typical traditional dance in Cambodia, so this appears to be um, taken from a local uh, vendor or shop. Um, with typical Cambodian phone numbers as well. Okay. And uh, do those appear to be the types of photographs that you would use either for a passport or a visa application or something of that nature? Yes. Okay, and explain when, you, when an individual travels to Cambodia on a visa, when they get into Cambodia, what types of visas may, might they obtain um, from local people, and I'm not talking about official visas, I'm talking about from local, um, I, I guess local, I don't know if I want to say black market, or what types of visas would they be able to obtain? So they could obtain anything from an official visa. In Cambodia, you can get a visa on arrival, so you can actually get a visa when you arrive at the airport, but once you're in country, in order to get a continued visa, 
you can either go through an agent to get an official visa or it's fairly common for criminals to get um, counterfeit or fake passports or uh, visas. Okay. Um, did you receive any information about uh, whether Ms. Dykes and Ms. Morata were trying to obtain any visas while they were there? So their visa, the original, at least one of the visas that they had was, I think I mentioned earlier, set to expire on February 26th. Uh, from what I had heard through my task force and talking to individuals, um, or maybe it was through an interview with Lisa and Nina, that they had gone to a travel agent in Cambodia, in Sihanoukville, to obtain a renewed visa. Now, Space 354 appears to be Lisa's uh, ticket from Dallas to Seoul, Korea. And uh, it appears to be boarding, that, that flight boarding at 10.55 a.m., um, leaving from Dallas. Is that, uh, is Korean Air one of the, um, I guess, airlines that flies that, that route? Yes, at the time, I believe it was almost the only flight um, leaving Dallas in order to get to Seoul, and let alone on to Cambodia. Uh, there were very, due, due to COVID, very limited um, flights available, uh, and the one main one that most people took between Cambodia and the United States was this flight through Seoul. Uh, this is actually for Nina Beltran, but that appears to be the second leg of that flight from Seoul to Henan Pen. Yes, you typically lose a calendar day because you cross over the international date line. So the flight, typically, if it left Dallas on December 25th, it would have arrived and then departed um, Seoul to Phnom Penh uh, on the following day. And states. 356 and 357. Uh, these appear to be the back of just some Cambodian customs de declaration. Correct. Standard um, immigration declaration uh, forms that everyone is provided on the plane when you're flying into Phnom Penh or into Cambodia. You fill out a card like this. States 358. Is the Marriott, um, there's to be a Marriott Courtyard uh, receipt, and you had all had information that they were staying in this hotel for a short time, is that correct? Yes, and this re receipt shows that their arrival date was December 26th, and in Cambodia they write the dates, um, the date, the day of the month first, and then the month, so it shows a departure date of January 8th of 2022. And it states uh, 359, this is just a, a, I guess, photocopy that was included in their documents of everything um, with the addition of uh, Lisa Beltran's passport card. And can you uh, see what the issuance date is on Ms. Beltran's passport card? Yes, this is a copy of Lisa, of a passport card in the name of Lisa Beltran issued December 11th of 2020. and those look like their boarding passes as well. Uh, Space 366, this is a receipt for an amount of $4,443 uh, charged for their trip um, to uh, Cambodia. And looking at pages two, and three, it appears that that is a one-way uh, 
actually it's a round trip um, with the date of January 25th, 2022 is their, uh, I guess, expected uh, return date. Is that correct? Yes. Stage 367, this is the last will and testament of uh, Lisa Beltran. Um, and we kind of went through this yesterday. This just has typical uh, language for a last will and testament, is that correct? Yes. And um, the first line is if, if Ms. Beltran passes, then everything will go to Nina Beltran. Um, and then on page two of states uh, 367, uh, there is the predeceased paragraph, and uh, this basically just states uh, in the event that uh, Miss Beltran, uh, I'm sorry, Nina Beltran predeceases uh, Lisa, then um, everything upon the death of Lisa Beltran should go to these individuals: Rachel Ann Hansen, Chelsea Keith, Aaron Keith, Kyle Williams. Emerald Beltran, the daughter of Charles Anthony Beltran and Megan Serrato, and Charlie Beltran, daughter of Charles Anthony Beltran and Jasmine Cannon. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And these documents were executed on January 30th of 2021. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, Stage 368 is, is the same, but uh, that of Nina Beltran, is that correct? Yes. States 369. These are uh, Nina's vows. Do they, these appear to be uh, wedding vows? Yes, handwritten. Handwritten wedding vows. 370. Those appear to be handwritten uh, Lisa's vows. Okay. And then 371. Uh, is that Nina and Lisa's unified vows? Yes. Okay. And then at the bottom it just mentions uh, Nina, Lisa, and Chuck closing. Is that correct? Yes. And at the bottom it says, we are hers, we are one. Yes. Now, uh, when you went through everything, did you see any vows uh, laminated like this uh, for Chuck? No. States 372. Um, this is a document uh, for Nina Murata, is that correct? Yes. And it's dated December 10th of 2021, is that right? Yes. Um, and it is uh, an application to uh, refund um, the, basically her contributions to the retirement system, is that correct? Yes. And that's just the back of that notice, is that correct? Correct. Now, when we were going through these documents, did it appear also that uh, Nina was uh, a poet and had a lot of uh, handwritten, you know, poetry and things like that that really have nothing to do with this case? Yes. Uh, States 376, this is the marriage license for uh, Nina and Lisa Beltran, um, dated May 8th of 2020. Yes. Uh, this is states uh, 377. This is a list of uh, various countries. And were you able to do some um, kind of research on what these countries have in common? Yeah, so this is a list of various countries in order by population. And several of these countries on this list are all countries where there is no extradition treaty between the United States and these countries listed. 
And then on the second page, um, it appears to be a map of Morocco. Three seventy-eight. Uh, this appeared to be a COVID test taken on December twenty-third of twenty twenty-one. Yes. Um, for Lisa Beltran. Correct. And uh, that location was uh, Farmers, Farmers Branch, Branch, Texas. Yes. Are you familiar with Farmers Branches? I'm not, <laughs> but I could look up the zip code and tell you whether or not it's close to Dallas. Okay, that's okay. Uh, State uh, three seventy-nine is the same for Nina Beltran. Correct. Now you mentioned that this was uh, the third of this type of case that you worked on um, during your time in Cambodia, is that correct? Uh, murder of fugitives, yes. Uh, dealt with a couple of other deportations as well. But And date-wise, uh, if I recall correctly, you said that you uh, kind of began your search in uh, the city of... Uh, you just tell the jury, what day did you begin your search uh, for them in the city of Siena? Um it was, I recall, early January when I found out that they had flown to Cambodia and we were looking actually in Phnom Penh for a little while, um, got information that they had stayed at the Courtyard Marriott, which is located in Phnom Penh. There was some information that someone thought that they may have seen them uh, in an area along the riverside, so we did some surveillance there in Phnom Penh, uh, did some surveillance there in January. Um, I don't recall exactly the date, but it was somewhere between um, late January or early February when we got information that their ATM was used in Sienoville, and then there were several transactions, um, appeared to be, if I recall correctly, ATM transactions in Sienoville. You mentioned that there was a sighting or a tip that they had been seen somewhere in Pyeong Pen. Um, do you all receive a lot of tips like that about, you know, uh, citing of these individuals? Not often. Okay. So it was something that we definitely wanted to act on. Um, whether or not it was Lisa and Nina, we did not confirm. But when our task force officers went out to do the surveillance, they did not see them. Okay. Um, but the bank records and the bank uh, ATM usage certainly was a very... Um, good piece of evidence and a good indication of where you can find it. Definitely. Now our test was cross-examination. Um, so it's an agent? A special agent. Special uh, agent, I want to make sure. <laughs> a, a lab is my current title, assistant legal attache. Okay, well special agent, I want to have a few questions for you. Um, you said you were shocked when she asked you you had jurisdiction to make the arrest. You didn't have jurisdiction to make the arrest, correct? No, it actually was not me that was executing the arrest. It was the Cambodian National Police. But you come up to them and tell them to put their hands behind the head or whatever order you're giving them, and she's saying, what jurisdiction did you have? Because you didn't have any to, to instruct them, did you? The task force leader had asked me to come up and to explain to them what was happening. Okay. Um, Ma'am, whether you're talking about Cambodia or you're talking about the United States, um, it's not unusual, or I'm not gonna say not unusual, but people who feel like they're being persecuted uh, by their country, uh, sometimes go to other countries to seek political asylum, no? Uh, I suppose so. I mean, it happens all the time. It, 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 but especially it happens here in the United States. Will you agree with that? I don't know, sir. Honestly, I haven't worked in the United States for a few years. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, as far as people who feel that they're being persecuted for whatever reason by their country, uh, or falsely accused, whatever, 
it's not unusual for people to try to go to other countries to seek uh, political asylum. I, I suppose. Okay. And as far as Lisa, we, 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 we see all these documentations. They had lawyers over there, didn't they? Pardon me? They had lawyers, didn't they? In Cambodia? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Well, they, they can speak to, to whether or not they have lawyers, correct? Yes, I, was, I think so. Okay. Um, as far as um, you indicated that there was no extradition treaty, that they were actually deported, right? Correct. So whether or not they were trying to fill out asylum paperwork, you have no idea, because that's not something y'all looked into, correct? Correct. That's fine. Thank you, Special Agent. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Uh, may this witness be finally excused? No objection, Your Honor. No objection, Your Honor. Thank you, Special Agent. You're free to leave and go about your
and that's, I think, of the young ones surviving. Mm -hmm. You know, their bodies could just hurt more. But yeah, they marched a Swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. Thank you, baby. See you. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Detectives, can you uh, state your name, spell your name, support for me, please? Uh, yes, my name is Daniel Hinton. Um, spell it as well, you said, I'm sorry? Yes, please. D A N I E L space H I N T O N. And can you tell the members of the jury um, what it is that you do for them? So I work for the Dallas Police Department. I've worked for them for the last 13 and a half years. Um, I currently work in their digital evidence lab associated with financial crimes. And we um, process digital evidence um, and try to do analysis work for detectives. Um, before that, I've worked in various other um, units, crimes against children. And then, of course, everybody works the street as well when you start. And uh, is there any special training or um, qualifications that you have to have to work uh, in the financial crime unit? Yeah, I think the lab requires. So our lab has a very good relationship with the Secret Service, and the Secret Service provides a lot of um, advanced training or some basic training and then further advanced training. Um, I also have a degree in computer science, um, which I worked in software for a little over 20 years before becoming a Dallas police officer. Um, so, yeah, there's ongoing training, um, doing all kinds of stuff. And some of the recent stuff was like skimmers and micro soldering and, and lots of stuff because there's a lot of, a lot of devices are now, light bulbs could be a device that uh, could be of interest. I mean, when people come in and front door locks and all that stuff. So as a society, there's a lot of digital devices always being around. So training is really important for sure. And uh, as far as your work in uh, the lab, what type of uh, work do you do there? Um, do, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it, it's a little bit of a loaded question, I'm sorry. Um, so we're a little short staffed, so I do pretty much everything in the lab. So um, <laughs> we, but as a lab, we serve basically all digital devices. Um, in our focus, um, in our lab is really the analysis work, trying to offload work from the detectives um, so they can continue on with their cases. They can come to us and, <coughs> and let us know what they're looking for, and we can try to help sort through. Like in most cases, there's like up to a million or more pieces of information that are found that have to be sorted through. So uh, it takes a little time. It's, it's not a very quick process. Um. Are you able to, uh, do you have certain software capabilities and things of that nature to um, extract information on things like USB drives, SIM cards, laptop computers, things of that nature? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. And in particular, you have a, a program called the Axiom program. Can you right. tell the jury about the Axiom program? Okay. So Axiom is a, a 
an analysis tool. It's put out by Magnet. Um, Magnet does a lot of different digital things. They do training. They have a, they're, they're a pretty um, strong force in the digital forensics field. Uh, we use their tool for, once we acquire data, we'll ingest it into Magnet, and then that'll be a tool that we can search through. We can, the tool is, is pretty robust and be able to look for like comparable pictures and running, if you have an image with street names, license plates, whatever else, it can pull out all the text in an image and different things like that. And it allows you to really kind of um, find pieces of information that it's not just in a text document or an email. It might be a, a car license plate that's not even really part of the picture. So. Yeah, their software is really useful, and then we have other tools that actually acquire the, there's a, a few primary tools, Celebrite makes them, Frankie makes them, that are required to actually acquire data these days because everything's encrypted, or most everything's encrypted. Um, in this particular case, uh, or I guess just in any case, how do you receive evidence to be extracted? Right, so the way our lab works is a detective will come um, and our lab secured, so they will we'll let them in, and then we'll take. We'll, we have a request form that they fill out, um, and then we'll take their property from them, and they will articulate what they're looking for, um, which is kind of the bulk of. If you looked at our request form, that's kind of the big section. That's what we're really interested. In. Of course, they have to provide legal process, search warrant, stuff like that for the devices that they submit, um, and I mean that's kind of the process. They bring it to us. We take custody of it. Um, they sign it over to us, and then when we're done with it, when we give them our, our deliverables plus their original data, they sign back for it to take it back. Okay, deliverables are those things like uh, certain reports, yeah. uh, information about the devices, yes. that nature? Yes, that's right. Okay, and then um, you generally provide um, a case file that's kind of a portable case mm -hmm. uh, with which they can also go through the um, extraction information using the action program. That's correct. Uh, Your Honor, at this time I would like to offer states 283 through 287 for record purposes only. And uh, these are the search warrants um, concerning certain devices in this case. Devices, um, three laptop computers, and a number of SIM cards from a detective Ortiz um, back in, uh, I believe it was December of 2022. I think so. Can I reference my notes as well? Is that yes, if you'd like to reference your notes to refresh your recollection. December 1st, he brought them in, and there were 10 devices, yes, three SIM cards, four USBs, and three laptops. And then he brought the accompanying search warrant, correct? Yes, ma'am. I think there were five in total. Five search warrants? I think so. Now, um, I want to focus on just a couple of those devices. Um, Now the search warrant references um, in regards to the USB drives, just four USB drives and kind of the name of the USB B drive, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and I'm showing you what's been already admitted as States Exhibit 346, 
Uh, does that appear to be the on brand O N N? Yeah, um, it looks like my label, and it looks like the same device as well. Okay, and then your label, you generate a, a particular number. Is that correct? Right. So we try to barcode everything. We'll put the case number that is actually associated in our lab. Our lab will create a case number, and then we'll have a case number with the department or whatever agency we're servicing. Um, and then we'll put a device number. So this one, it's 2022-59-4. So this would be like item four in my report. You would see this listed as item four. Okay. Yeah. And um, short-term memory problem. This, is state, this was uh, a part of states uh, 352 and HP laptop. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. is this the HP laptop that you also received from De Detective Ortiz? Yes, it looks very familiar. It's damaged. It's got my label and the numbers as well. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Did you complete an extraction of this laptop as well? I did. Um, upon that distraction, did uh, extraction, did you create... Uh, some reports uh, concerning the contents of those two items. Yes. And Detective, I'm showing you what's been marked states uh, 388 through 391. Uh, now, 388, is that just a photograph of that HP laptop? That's, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Device 8. And then uh, it states 389, is that a photograph of that uh, particular flash drive? Yes, it is. Okay, now states 390, is that a uh, copy of your forensic exam examination? Uh, it looks like it for sure. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, yes, it's, it's got all the information on it. But it appears to be mine, yes. Okay. And um, does this include... Uh, the two items in states 389 and 388, the yes. extraction report of those items. Right, it will include those two and everything else as well. Yes. Okay. And also 391, does that, uh, states 391, does that appear to be your extraction report? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it does. And uh, that extraction report, again, is of uh, items 388 and 389. Sorry. Yes. I'm sorry, yes. Okay. <laughs> Just looking. Yes. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, State Office 388 through 391 for all purposes, Henry Defense Counsel. Yeah, so the software, like in our case, Magnet Axiom, when it, it understands certain properties about all kinds of different devices. And so anytime it finds a piece of information that it understands, maybe it's a, a PDF file or an image or it's a certain type of a file, then it declares that, it, it labels it as an artifact, basically. Um, and then, the, so the process of review will go through um, out of all those artifacts and try to identify items of interest based on what the, the detective is looking for. Um, so the report has a, in this particular case, had a pool of like, I usually put it in my report. So um, yeah, over 911,000 artifacts were in that pool to go through, which is partly why it takes so long to process these devices. 
So 911,000 in the artifacts, and that could be PDFs, word files, anything that, that the program identifies as a piece of information. Yes, ma'am. Now, are you able to then um, kind of narrow the focus uh, using the program to certain items? Yeah, so the, the, the software is very good about categorizing stuff. So right off the bat, it'll categorize and it'll give you high-level things. Um, like you'll have a category of media, for example, and then inside media, there might be all different types of files that have media, video files, images, different types of image files, um, those kind of things. So the, the software tries to break it down in what it understands at a high level. So you can kind of, if you want to look at communication, you can go to communication, then you can go into text messages or emails or whatever else and kind of break it down into stuff. Um, so yeah, the tool is um, very robust, but a good tool for sure. And uh, the program itself, the, the Axiom tool, um, it takes quite a bit of, I guess, memory uh, on a computer for it to be able it, to... It can be. When there's a lot of artifacts, it can be a little bit of a... Yeah, so we another function in the lab, we'll often let people come in and use a computer or something because unfortunately not all of the resources that not all of the computers that are given to people will run all these I mean it's not their fault they have a lot of devices in their case so yeah we provide we allow people to use our devices sometimes to look at their reports for sure um commissioner published states three year on human now this is your uh, forensics examination report and Looking at page one, that's uh, of states 390. That's just your cover sheet. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. In this particular report, the case was generated December 16th, and the report was generated December 20th of 2022. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, we won't go through every page of this, but uh, page three of this report, does this just kind of highlight each of the devices um, that you are uh, attempting to extract information? or have extracted information from using the Axiom program. Right, so as we ingest or as we allow the software to go through and kind of identify artifacts, we will typically identify a piece of evidence with information like here. We typically will try to use, the case, again, the case number to the device number. Like you can see evidence items at 2022-59, that's the case, and then dash 10, that tells me that's device 10. So it's easy, that way when you're looking at the reports, you can quickly identify what device it was found on. Okay. And so in this case, you had 10 devices to um, extract and, and SIM cards and some flash drives and three laptop computers, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And we only see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven listed. Um, what does that indicate to you? Oh, well, yeah, okay. So there were a couple of the drives on the Dells were encrypted. So they were able to be acquired, but acquiring encrypted data, I mean, it's not the, the it's the, the acquisition isn't the difficult part, it's really understanding the data. So an encrypted drive, like most everybody's phones these days, is gonna be encrypted. Um, so yeah, we acquired it, but it's encrypted and it has no value at, in its encrypted state, so it's probably not included there. I would have to bring it up to, to look, but that would be my assumption. Okay. And Uh, the next page, page four, um, this is just kind of an example of, uh, or is this an example of how this uh, program kind of reports back to you um, certain, I guess, artifacts of interest? So this is, the lab generates a couple deliverables. We have a, an examiner report, which is a little more human readable and articulates kind of specific details related to what the detective is doing. This report is a more general report um, as we're going through and processing the device, there'll be things that might be of interest. It might be a, a photograph that's related somehow, or, or things that, that as we're looking at the data, we think it's an, it could be of interest to the detective. So we'll typically tag all those as of interest. Um, and then at the end, I mean, and then we'll go through a course of review with the detective as well before we produce our, our final. Um, but this report here, like record two, that would be an item, if you look at that first line, it says tags, in the software, you can identify, you can put stuff as evidence, you can, you can create any kind of tag you want to tag all the pieces of data. Um, but these are all of interest. We just try to produce a generic, not a generic, but a, a simple report of items of interest for this case. 
And so these are all items of interest in this case. Okay. And uh, the first few pages um, appear to just, the items of interest uh, just appear to be email, various email addresses uh, of either um, Nina Morano or I don't know who Milton Mocha is. It's a username. I stands with Hotmail. You don't really know what the importance of these things are. They're just tagged as, as items of interest. Yeah, so the a lot of the devices will the software is pretty good about trying to identify users of devices, and so that's something, of course, you want to identify right away is try to identify who the device might belong to, and usernames and email accounts and all those things. Um, those typically get tagged as of interest because they potentially have either another path for searching down, providing maybe the detective will want to pursue an email account that they didn't know about, and they'll get legal process and they'll pursue that. So there's information potentially in here that they may or may not know already, so we'll tag it as potentially of interest. Okay, and just uh, for the jury, um, just to kind of educate us on uh, some of these things, uh, the created date and time, it says 531, um, 531 of uh, 2020 at 2.47 p.m. Do you know if that is 100% uh, you know, accurate about when that was created, or can you give the jury kind of an explanation about what? Um, dates and times are difficult with digital devices for the most part. Um, uh, it's kind of a hard question. I mean, there's people, it's almost like if, you, if you're an auto mechanic, that doesn't mean you can fix a transmission necessarily because you probably want to take a car to a transmission mechanic for that. Dates and times is one of those things too. The whole field of data analysis is, is a broad field. And just like you go to a doctor, you don't just go to one doctor. There's something wrong with your brain, you want to go to a brain specialist or something. It's similar to like that. There's people that could probably tell you a lot more about dates and times than I do. Um, I approach dates and times with caution. Um, this is probably a, a pretty accurate I mean, it says it's the date it was created, but what that means is a little harder to define for this particular one that you're showing me right here. Um, I, don't, I don't feel like I'm answering your question. No, you, it's complicated. It is, is it is, yes, that's okay. right. Especially when we have multiple devices with different operating systems and files being copied to and from, USBs and all that stuff. Um, all those dates interact and it gets really messy very quickly. Okay. Now, Looking here on page six of uh, states 390, um, one of the uh, of interest thing here is a, a username of Death Angel 7163, and that platform is Instagram, and the service is Instagram.com. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. It looks like the password is um, you know these That's numbers, letters, this combination of numbers and letters right there. That's correct. And then it appears on page six that, um, as opposed to uh, page four of uh, States 390, that these addresses are a combination of uh, Lisa and Nina at Outlook.com, and we have Nina Beltran and N. Beltran, um, which before we had uh, Nina Morado um, as the primary email address, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Looking on uh, page 12 of States 390, does this appear to be a uh, picture of a passport for Nina Beltran? I'm sorry, was that a question? Yes, does this appear to be a, a... Yes, it looks like that to me. Okay. And the issuance date uh, on this picture appears to be September 20th of 2021. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, do you recall, um, and I, I'm, I'm looking for the line here, what device uh, you were able to extract so if you look down at the bottom, you'll see source, and if you look at the ID number, you'll see it's the case number dash four, so that would have been on the USB drive. Okay, the on USB drive? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that particular drive seemed to have a, a lot of information that 
Yeah, it looked like it would have had a lot of Dropbox related stuff copied to it. Okay. Uh, does this appear to be a passport for Lisa Beltran of the same issue as date? Yes, ma'am. Uh, page 14 of States 390. Now, I don't expect you to know uh, the relevance or importance of this, but does this appear to be I recognize a, it, yeah. You recognize that document? Yeah, just because it was uh, interesting because of the different fonts and stuff on it for the nation it's from. Okay. Uh, Artisans Association of Cambodia, and it's uh, addressed to both Nina Beltran and Lisa Beltran, and, and the date is October 24, 2021. Right. Uh, concerning the registered name Enterprise of BNB Enterprises LLC. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then we have Warren Money Enterprises LLC mentioned uh, down at the bottom with contact person of Nina Beltran. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, page 15 of states uh, 390 that appears to be a continuation of that letter is that correct yes okay and uh, this uh, particular part uh, is talking about traveler information of Lisa Beltran and uh, kind of the trip purpose of identifying products that are marketable in the B&B target market create relationships with manufacturers, undertake market research studies, and analyze the results to develop a strategy for growing a global outlet for the identified Cambodian products. Uh, length of stay, 30 days, is that? Yes, ma'am, that's what it says. Okay. Page 16 of States 390, uh, this is another letter, um, and it appears to be directed to the Royal Embassy of Cambodia. Um, and again, this is, uh, concerning the BNB Enterprises LLC, is that correct? Yes. Um, and this is concerning Nina Beltran, and it's to confirm that Nina Beltran is engaged in uh, brand develop as the brand development director for BNB Enterprises LLC. Um, this particular document is dated November 2nd, 2021. Is that, that appear correct? Mm -hmm. And, um, I believe there's a, a sentence there. Ms. Beltran will be traveling to Cambodia from December 26 to uh, 2021 to January 25th, 2022 for a total of 30 days to identify products that are marketable. Yes. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Uh, state 17 appears to be um, pretty much the same letter from uh, the same enterprise, uh, but this one is for Lisa Beltran, is that correct? Yeah, Ms. Beltran, that's correct. Okay. State, uh, page 22 of States 390, is that just appear to be a marriage certificate for Nina, Tamar, Morano, and Lisa Dykes? Passport card for Elisa Beltran uh, with the issuance date of December 11th, uh, 2020. Yes, ma'am. And does that appear to be a driver's license for Charles Anthony Beltran? It looks like an ID card for. And I, I'm sorry, it's an ID card. Yes, ma'am. Okay, different than a driver's license. Yes, ma'am. Uh, expiration date of 5 8 18. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, that appeared to be a birth certificate, birth certificate for the same individual. Yes, Charles Beltran.
Now, here on um, page 44 of States 390 uh, of interest, um, what does that file name say? It says T visa. T visa? Yes. Um, were you able to uh, pull any other information about uh, that particular uh, PDF, if you're aware? I, I can't remember and I can't tell from just this. I'm sorry. <coughs> That's okay. I mean, I do have my computer if I need to, to look at it, but otherwise okay. I, I can't tell. Sorry. Um, file name BNB Enterprises LLC underscore S4 PDF. And then um, the author there appears to be the IRS. Is that the Internal Revenue Service? Is there? Yeah, there were several EIN forms and stuff that were part of this case, so it, it could be a an IRS form. I don't recall. Um, Sorry, there were, what? I can't hear you. There were several um, like correspondences from the IRS for these businesses, so the tax ID number, the EIN number. Um, so there, there were forms from other entities on these devices. I couldn't say again, I'm sorry, without actually looking at the document. But the author is, so can I articulate? Yes, yes, so yes, devices, um, different types of files can have other information. I mean, you might have a file that's a picture, but it might have all kinds of stuff like on your phone. It might have where it was taken, who took it, what device took it, all that stuff, it's called metadata. And all kinds of files have metadata. Um, PDF files, Word files, all these have metadata. And it may or may not be accurate, but it, it, so that author field there would probably come out, I would assume that that came out of the metadata associated with this PDF file. And at the time that this was captured, it contained IRS in it. Yes, it was taken interest. Okay, and then also the Lisa Beltran T visa application, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, there on states page, uh, page 48 of states 90, is that the pretrial conditions of bond um, that appears to be on the flash drive? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, and that is, uh, again, this is the flash drive. Um, dash 4, makes dash this flash drive, that's correct. This was tagged of interest in it. Uh, it says suspect Charles Beltran 0403-2021.wma. Uh, what kind of file is that? It's a Windows media file. Okay. So um, it's, in this particular case, it was an audio recording. Um, so it was a, a long audio recording. About two hours and 11 minutes? Something like that, yeah, of the, of the interview. Of the interview of the co defendant Charles Beltran. That's correct. And this this was on um, device eight? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, and that would be the 
HP laptop that we have That's in business. Correct. It was also on for uh, that same interview was also on the um, flash drive. Yes, ma'am. And that's listed on um, page sixty-nine. Okay. Uh, states three ninety. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, also, Windows Media File Suspect. Charles Beltran, 04-03-2021. Yes. Okay, and that was the, the actual report. Yes. Yeah, and you can, the the, <laughs> the two rows there, MD5 hash and SHA-1 hash, are basically file signatures that identify the contents. Um, so if those two, if one of those matches to the other one, then you know the file's exactly the same. So and that's kind of how we prove that files didn't change or that they were original, since we'll hash things. And it, it's, you can think of it as like a fingerprint almost. It's, it's kind of unique to a file. It's an algorithm that's generated. And, and if one little tiny bit in the file will change, you get a totally different number. Um, so that's why the report also contains hash files, so that can be verified. So, I mean, just to kind of sum up, there's, there are several other of uh, interest items to have through out this report, but um, whoever had possession of the uh, laptop and of the flash drive also had possession of Charles Beltran's interview. Yes, it appears so. Yes, ma'am. Now, in case 391. Uh, you did, a, I guess, a search, for lack of a better term, for a certain time frame uh, that I asked you to look at for the flash drive and also the HP laptop. Is that correct? Is this the one for today? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And looking at page five of states uh, 391. Um, it appears uh, search, and these are, let me back up a little bit. What particularly did I ask you to look for? Um, if you recall. I'd have to see. If I'm... Uh, searches for passport, change name, form. Of course, this is going to be my script. The thing may not be exactly what you asked Yeah, that's for. okay. This is what I wrote down. <laughs> what things were you looking for? Right, um, and then child support around 10-9, and passport photo portal. Um, those were kind of the, the the main ideas that you were looking for. At okay. least that's what I took. And were many of these items Google searches? Yeah, yeah, in different um, in, in different viewers, but yeah, Google searches were used. Yes. Okay, and so we have search term on record one. Page uh, five of states 391. Uh, the search session starts 10 10 2020. Um, is that date fairly accurate? I would expect so. Okay. It's not in our time zone, but it is that time is correct, I would expect. Okay. Yes. Um, and again, uh, same search term passport photo tool online 10 10 2020. Um, looking Further down page five, uh, search term of passport appointment. Mm -hmm. And that search appears to be uh, done on 3 6 of 2020. Uh, you said 10 6 of 2020. I'm sorry, 10 6 of 2020 at 3.33 yes, p.m. Now that's in UTC time, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so we. It's back 6 up or 5, I always have to look. I don't count okay. that myself, so yeah. Uh, so we back up either five or six hours Correct. to find the appropriate time. Right. So um, as far as this is concerned, if it was 3.33 p.m., Matt skills about 9 or 10 a.m. Yeah. yeah. On 10.6, is that correct? Yeah, somewhere around there. Okay, and uh, uh, the search is for a passport appointment. Here at the bottom record four is another search for a passport 
photo tool online. Looking here at page 7 of States 391, um, under review tags, it says username C Beltran 89, and uh, the created date time is 10 9 of 2020, mm -hmm. uh, about 8 25 p.m., which is about 3 p.m. Central Time. Mm -hmm. And I'm that. sorry, okay. yes, okay. <laughs> sorry. The URL there is texassmartchildsupport.com. Is that Yes, that's what it says. Okay. Looking at page nine of the States 391, it just uh, appears to be four records of various uh, passport renewal. Uh, free passport photos online, U.S. State Department Google search, and U.S. passports. Is that is that accurate? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and the first three are on 1010 of 2020, and the uh, U.S. passport renewal application uh, is 106 of 2020. Yes, ma'am. Page 10 of uh, States 391, again, are multiple uh, passport agencies, Dallas passport agencies, searches, and websites, uh, all dated 10 6 of 2020. That's correct. So there are several of these um, tags uh, based on that search for passports, and it appears uh, that those. Yeah. Tags uh, occurred, or the created time was 10 6 of 2020 or 10 10 of 2020 in that range. That's correct. Okay. Here on page 14, uh, does this appear to be a photograph of an individual? Yeah, I tagged it because it looked like it could be a candidate for a passport photo with a background and all. Okay. And it was in the time of interest for you. Uh, page 15 of today's 391, we're looking at record two, and uh, the file name is Child Support Payment 1019 of 2020. Page 18, that's the last page of, of your report, is that correct? Um, yes, it looks like it. Back up just a little bit. Uh, and that was just based on, on uh, the passport search, the child support search, and that time frame that um, correct. I requested you to do this. That's part, correct. That correct. Yes, it is. Searches. Did you find any searches or information about asylum paperwork or asylum requirements that you recall? 
I don't recall finding asylum. I, I don't think I searched for asylum either, though. Okay, so you would have been actually searching for that. What, I mean, so all the information is still there, um, but when you search, then it's trying to find that key word in all these different artifacts. Um, so you can still stumble across information all the time. That happens all the time. But I don't recall stumbling across the I say as asylum, and I don't remember that being part of the search criteria for us. Okay. Um, and there were over 900,000 artifacts. Okay. That's correct, 911 <laughs> over, yes. Okay, did you find um, case files in there since uh, both of these individuals are in the legal profession, one being an attorney, one being a paralegal? Did you find case files uh, regarding clients? It looked like there were a lot of legal documents as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes, ma'am, I do. Thank you. May be seated. Ms. Pittman, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, sir, can you uh, state your name, spell your name, put forward, forward, please? Yep. My name is Taylor Page. It's spelled T A Y L O R P A G E. And uh, can you tell the jury what it is you do for a living? I'm a special agent with the FBI here in Dallas. Uh, what are your qualifications that allow you to be a special agent? Uh, we go through about a, a five-month uh, training program out in Quantico. Uh, we've got continued uh, training once we're actually assigned to an office, um, both in the way of legal proceedings as well as some general tactical training and things of that nature. How long have you been a uh, special agent with the FBI? Uh, coming up on six years. Always in Dallas? Yes, ma'am. And um, do you all sometimes work in uh, conjunction with local law enforcement on certain violent crimes? Yes, I'm assigned to a violent crimes task force. Uh, so we've got some FBI agents assigned, as well as officers or detectives from uh, various local police departments around the area. Now, as a special agent, um, what are some of the types of cases that you investigate and Kind of what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Yep, uh, so specifically the Violent Crimes Task Force, as you uh, may assume, is focusing on violent crimes. Uh, so robberies, uh, specifically robberies of, of businesses, will also work uh, kidnappings, carjackings, bank robberies, uh, anything that's got kind of a, a violent nexus to it. Okay. Are you about also CAST certified? Yes, I And uh, can you just tell the jury what CAST is? Yep, uh, so it's the Cellular Analysis Survey Team. Uh, so I'm a member of that team uh, for the FBI. Uh, we go through various certification in order to uh, look at and analyze cellular records and then map those records and create vis basically visual aids uh, that would go along with it. Okay. Um, how is it that you, uh, being a part of the FBI, will become involved in a case, uh, you know, a state case or a, a local law enforcement case? So usually that happens uh, through some sort of correspondence with one of our task force officers. Uh, one of them is typically aware of some sort of an offense that may have occurred in their city uh, and they'll bring that forward uh, so that the entire uh, task force can have input and help with that, uh, which was very much the, the case here. And so in this particular case, when uh, you were contacted, when the FBI was contacted to become a part of this case? Uh, it was right around the, the middle of October. I don't know if I have the exact date, but sometime in the early to middle of October okay. of 2020. Of 2020. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay, and um, who do you recall, uh, if, if you remember, um, I guess discussing that with, and, and how did you get caught up to speed on what was going on? Uh, I believe that came through one of our task force officers assigned with the Dallas Police Department. Uh, she had made us aware that there was a, a missing persons case uh, that they weren't they weren't sure if it was a kidnapping. Uh, basically, this this gal had been unable to be located, uh, and obviously then looked for some assistance from the task force in trying to locate her. Okay. And FBI, uh, do you think there, you all may have some more tools and things at your disposal that maybe local law enforcement doesn't have? Sure. Yeah, I think that's probably fair to say. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, more manpower. Um, yeah, at, at least from the, the task force side of things, we have kind of a unique ability to uh, put some more assets uh, towards the specific cases that we're working on, whereas a, a normal detective may have uh, dozens of cases that they're trying to work at any one time. Uh, task force kind of allows us to put some more focus and effort into uh, certain things. Okay. And uh, you said that uh, you learned that a, a female had uh, gone missing. Yes, ma'am. Um, what information did you learn? Uh, that she had flown in to Dallas from Seattle uh, to visit a, a friend, uh, had gone out in the Bellum area of Dallas, and didn't take her flight back out the next day that she was scheduled to leave, uh, and hadn't had any contact with any family member since then. And your primary focus um, in this case would be just to get uh, any information you can about maybe where she went, what happened to her, things like that. Yeah, uh, at least from the, the task force side of things, our initial involvement was uh, just trying to locate her, uh, you know, with the, the hope that she would still be alive somewhere. Uh, we were basically deployed to try to explore any options that may exist in order to, uh, to assist with finding her. Now, are you uh, connected or do you know all the things that local law enforcement are doing at the same time to locate this woman? No, ma'am. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll know some things generally, uh, but there's absolutely, uh, I think in this particular case, there were several folks that were out there trying to canvas for video, uh, do interviews, so we, we unfortunately didn't have uh, communications to what every single person was doing. As far as missing persons cases when it comes to um, young people in that age group, 20, 23, 25, somewhere around there. Um, do you have any idea how many calls Dallas gives, maybe on a daily basis, of young people missing? I don't know the exact number, uh, but I feel as though I recall during the course of this investigation learning that it was quite a few. Okay. How often do you all get involved? Uh, not terribly often. Uh, the FBI's assistance usually comes in in the form of AMBER alerts, um, so especially from the CASA perspective, uh, that's where, where I'll be involved in cases, most likely, is if there's an Amber Alert. Uh, we can usually look at things with some cellular records that can be helpful in that instance. Uh, in this particular one, like I said, one of our task force officers just identified that there was something that was just generally not right with someone flying in from out of town with a return flight that was booked. Uh, and they obviously had the, the perception that things were, were troublesome and needed a, a closer eye. And so you learned that uh, Maricel Vitello had flown in, didn't return uh, back on a return flight. What other uh, things about that individual did you all learn that, that made you think that the FBI needed to be involved? Uh, so specifically, we had some information related to her bank transactions. Uh, and then during the course of our initial involvement, we also got some of her cellular records. Uh, and the combination of those two things were really kind of what led us to the point of uh, identifying some, some folks that we thought may be of interest and kind of realize that there's probably something more to this than just, uh, hey, she really liked Dallas and wanted to stay here. Okay. Uh, at some point, did you develop uh, what you would call a person of interest? Yes, ma'am. And what is a person of interest? Uh, person of interest is someone that law enforcement, I'd say, would like to speak to, uh, that they probably haven't spoken with yet. but may have some information that would be beneficial to learn uh, during the course of an investigation. Okay. And were you all able to identify Charles Beltran as that person of interest? Yes, ma'am. And uh, besides Charles Beltran, did you ever name anyone else as a person of interest? or? I think the official naming of a, a person of interest came from uh, Dallas PD uh, in an email that I had 
I think, drafted to them. I, I said that Charles Beltran is something, someone that we should absolutely talk to. Uh, but as far as the official naming of who may be a person of interest, I think that comes from Dallas PD. Okay. Uh, and what was the reason that you all uh, named Charles Beltran as a person of interest? Yep. Uh, so during the first few days that we were looking through things, uh, we had come across specifically some footage from 7-Eleven, a convenience store where uh, Ms. Botello had a, a transaction and we obtained some surveillance footage from that 7-Eleven where you could see Ms. Patello and uh, another individual uh, walk into the store and uh, Mr. Beltran had some uh, pretty unique gauges in his ears uh, and we were able to marry up uh, the footage from the 7-Eleven uh, to some other video that we had seen on things and we uh, pretty quickly identified that he was the person that Maricel was with that night and we, we thought it would be beneficial to talk to him and so we said, hey, this would be a, a good person to, to try to focus on for things. Okay, and that was um, right at the beginning of when you all were involved in the investigation? Yes, ma'am. And uh, was that, you said, uh, middle of October, about October 12th or so? Yes, ma'am, that sounds correct. Okay, were you able to identify uh, residents for Mr. B Mr. Beltran? Um, yes, uh, we identified a residents in Mesquite. And did you all travel out to Mesquite to try to find him and talk to him? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Were you able to uh, develop a phone number for Mr. Beltran at that time? At that time, we did not have a phone number for Mr. Beltran, no ma'am. Okay. Uh, tell the jury about uh, your trip out to Mesquite to try to locate Mr. Beltran. Yep, uh, so we went to, I believe the address was 3113 Kensington, uh, because we had identified a vehicle that was associated with Mr. Beltran, uh, black Audi that I believe came back as registered to that address. Uh, so in, during the course of investigating other folks that may be associated to that address, uh, and again trying to, to locate Mr. Beltran, uh, we came up with Ms. Dykes' name uh, and information related to her. Okay. And uh, when you went out there, was anyone uh, at the residence? Uh, no one answered the door, uh, so we, we rang the doorbell. Um, were you able to locate a phone number or any contact information for Ms. Dykes? Yes, ma'am. And how were you able to locate that? Uh, I believe that was a combination of the Texas workforce information as well as uh, information associated <laughs> with some prior Mesquite Police Department reports uh, where I think a phone number was listed as well. Okay. And these prior Mesquite Police Department reports, um, did you review those reports? I, I did not personally, no, ma'am. Not that I can recall. So you don't know what they were about? No, ma'am. Now, uh, were you able to contact Ms. Dykes? Uh, so when we went there to ring the doorbell, uh, I also called the phone number that we had for listed for Ms. Dykes, yes, ma'am. Okay, and um, did she answer the phone? She did. And what was your conversation with her? Uh, it's trying to be very cordial, uh, just because uh, obviously we're showing up without notice to someone's house. Uh, so we brought a uniformed Mesquite police officer with us. Uh, There's a ring doorbell, uh, so it's kind of trying to. It, if you have an FBI agent call you on the phone, a lot of folks know that that there's scams that get associated with that. So we're trying to make our our presence known and identify who we were. So standing in front of the ring doorbell, kind of waving, showing the uniformed officer that was with us. Uh, and kind of stated, hey, we're, we're here, we'd like to hopefully get in touch with Mr. Beltron. And uh, what was Ms. Dyke's response? Uh, she said that she hadn't seen Mr. Beltron in three to four weeks uh, and asked if I could inquire about the nature of, of their relationship uh, and she said she didn't wish to speak with me any further on things with, with that. Okay. It was a pretty short phone call. Yeah, I think it lasted a, a few minutes maybe uh, by the time I got an answer and then tried to go through who, who we were, so, yeah. Uh, at any point during that conversation, did she indicate that she didn't believe who you were or anything of that nature? Not that I can recall. I, I know that we kind of went out of our way to stand in front of the ring camera uh, just to try to show some level of verification of, of who we were. Uh, were you able to get a phone number or any information about Mr. Belcher? No, ma'am. I asked for forwarding information and uh, none was provided. Uh, what did you do after that uh, point in your investigation? 
Uh, so shortly after that, uh, from an FBI perspective, in order for us to continue to pursue investigating things, we have to have some sort of a, a federal nexus or federal component to continue. So at this one, at the onset, I think I mentioned, uh, we looked at it as a possible kidnapping uh, because there wasn't any indication uh, of how exactly uh, or what happened to uh, Ms. Patello after she left the downtown area. When we came about the video from 7-Eleven uh, that showed her going into the store very willingly, uh, she looked like she was smiling at the time. Uh, from an FBI perspective, again, we kind of said, hey, this doesn't look like a kidnapping anymore. Uh, this looks like someone that's voluntarily uh, with Mr. Beltran uh, making this purchase. So we said, hey, in order for us to uh, keep going on this, we need a, an official request. And that kind of goes into the other way that the FBI can get involved in things is through official requests from state and local partners. Uh, and at that time, uh, there was no official request for the FBI to continue investigating. Um, prior to, I guess, this uh, phone call, because I asked you what you did after this phone call, trying to locate Mr. Beltran, uh, were there some other uh, actions that you all took in your investigation? Yes, ma'am. And what were those? Uh, we attempted to interview, or go canvas, I guess I should say, for, for video, interview folks uh, in the Deep Ellum area that may have possibly seen Ms. Patel. And uh, were you able to locate anyone in the, that area at that time? One of our task force officers came across uh, someone at Reno's uh, that said that they saw someone that fit the description of Maricela on the night of the 5th. Okay, and um, what was that description? Uh, the, I think it was a, a stature description, so kind of the, the black hair, uh, and then the, that person, again, this is coming through an email from another task force officer, uh, but that person said that they saw someone that fit the description that was, I think they used the words tweaking out and asking for a cigarette. Okay, and uh, stature-wise, uh, Maricela uh, was small in stature. Small in stature, yes, ma'am. Um, about five foot tall, maybe a hundred pounds. I, I don't know if there was uh, specifics that were given from that that person that our task force officer spoke with, uh, but just generally fit a close enough description that it was worth some follow up. Okay, and um, young Hispanic female. I I don't know for sure. Don't know I, I don't know for sure what he spoke to that person about. Okay, but that does describe Ms. Patel. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, is that a I don't want to say common because she's an individual, but is that a, a fairly common, um, I guess, description or, or um, just individual of, in this area, in the Dallas area? I, I mean, I, I don't know what the exact demographic breakdown is, but I would imagine that several people would fit that description, yes. Okay. Now, uh, so that nexus uh, now is gone. You all are not involved in the investigation at that point, is that correct? That's correct. At what point did you get back involved with the investigation? I think the FBI received a formal request from the Dallas Police Department to kind of re-involve themselves uh, in the middle of November. And um, why did they ask you all to re-involve yourself at that point? I think that there was still some genuine concern uh, that she was unable to be located at that, at that point. Um, again, things relating maybe to cell phone records that, that we could try to do some exploitation on, uh, and I'm sure manpower portion of that as well. Okay. At some point, were you able to, uh, I guess, get a phone number for Mr. Beltran? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and did you try to contact him? I don't recall if I specifically tried to contact him. I'm, I'm certain someone did, though. Okay. Um, as in November, um, how did you all start back up in your investigation? Uh, when we first got back into things, I believe there were, uh, again, some historical cell records that we were trying to uh, take a look at to see where folks were uh, in order to, to interview them, um, as well as then interview some, some co-workers and associates uh, of Ms. Dykes and uh, Mr. Beltran. And were you again able to locate some of these people and, and interview some of these people? Uh, yes, the FBI, or at least the task force, uh, was able to do that, yes, ma'am. Do you recall who all you interviewed? There were several folks uh, from Ms. Dykes, uh, former employer, um, and then some, I think it was primarily uh, females that were associated to Mr. Beltran, uh, and don't really recall everyone's name, though. Okay, it was one of those Medellin Alvarez? That sounds correct. Okay, 
way and uh, Olivia Ramirez, as far as a co-worker of Ms. Dykes, Olivia Ramirez. That sounds accurate as well, yes ma'am. Uh, were you able to talk to some of uh, Mr. Beltran's friends, Dax Stevens? Yes um, ma'am. And had any of them heard from him in a, some time? I think, uh, and again, I think Medellin is probably the only one that had seen him with any recency. And you learned from her that she had taken him up to Pennsylvania? Yes, ma'am. And uh, left him there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, the historical cell phone records, were you able to, based on those, uh, the analysis of those records, um, what steps did you take in your investigation at that point? So, uh, the cell phone records were uh, beneficial in trying to locate uh, places of interest that uh, may be worth searching for for Ms. Patello. Um, so at least when we kind of re-involved ourselves with things, uh, that was when we started to develop uh, an area in South Dallas that may be of interest in uh, going to search as it related to the location of those records historically. And um, did you all kind of search those areas? Yes, ma'am. So uh, originally there was uh, one site in South Dallas that was searched, where which was uh, unsuccessful in finding anything that was down uh, in the area where those records were. South Dallas, was that kind of the Wilmer area? That's correct. Okay, was that near like a concrete? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. And, I mean, did you all, uh, I guess, uh, were there several individuals out there as a part of this? I think we had several dozen that were out there uh, searching that area. Okay. Um, what other steps did you take in uh, your investigation during the November time? Uh, and just to be clear, that, that first search was after the November time frame. Um, but I kind of think we more or less reached the point, at least from what I can readily recall, of what the FBI was able to assist with at the onset. I think shortly after that, uh, the case got transferred over to a different unit within the Dallas Police Department, uh, which kind of took the lead on, on things um, and obviously decision making for investigations then. Uh, so once uh, the SIU, then you're talking about the Special Investigations Unit? Yes, ma'am. Once they took over, they kind of also took over the decision making, is that correct? I think that's probably fair to say, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, when, after that point, you said, stated that um, you all had a, uh, conducted a search out in an area near a concrete plant near Wilmer, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And did you learn the area of where Marissa Sella's body was found? Uh, again, we're now kind of moving a couple months after that fact, but yes, at, at some point in, I think, March of uh, 21, we did find uh, that Maricel's body was recovered in an area close to where we were searching. Okay. Um, from November to, to the point of uh, when her uh, remains were found in Wilmer, um, do you recall what other steps you took in your investigation at that time? I think we were, at least from an FBI perspective and the task force perspective, uh, we were trying to help locate uh, Ms. Dykes, Mr. Beltran, in order to, again, get in front of them to be interviewed. Uh, so we were focusing on uh, both of them having left the Dallas area and going to various other spots, we found information related to border crossings for them. Um, and again, just trying to develop uh, you know, where they might be. And then in the course of that, obviously, learn information about uh, things related, potentially related to the investigation that we wanted to pass on uh, to SIU. Okay. And uh, so you learned that they were making border cro crossings during uh, the month of December. Yes, ma'am. Um, were you, did you ever, or were you ever able to um, locate via cell phone pings or anything of that nature um, where they were traveling around in the United States? I believe there were records that went into kind of the northeast area, but I, I would want to see the actual records in order to say that definitively. Okay. And uh, were you able to use some of the uh, investigative tools um, at your disposal to located that they that it, at some point traveled to the Florida area? Uh, yes, ma'am. I think we were, were able to figure that out uh, through associations to 
vehicles uh, that came back as being registered to uh, Ms. Dykes or an associate that suggested that they were down in Florida. And you were passing this information along to uh, the Dallas Police Department? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And um, at some point did you learn uh, that um, Ms. Dykes and Ms. Murano had been arrested in the Florida area? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, were you all uh, a part of trying to locate Mr. Beltran after their arrest in Florida? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, after the point of their arrest, what role did you have in uh, any investigation at that point? Uh, following their arrest, there is nothing substantive related to uh, the murder investigation that we were involved in until such time as uh, we were told that the ankle monitors uh, were removed and uh, they had probably fled the country. And why did, or I guess what information did you receive that uh, led you to believe that they had fled the country? Uh, we had information that they were at DFW Airport. Uh, and I think that we somehow, it may have been SIU that knew that they caught a flight out of the international terminal. I can't remember where that information came in from, uh, but we, we knew that they were at the airport. And at that point, how, how did you get back involved in the investigation? Is that also a, a situation where uh, Dallas Police Department has to specifically ask for your help? Yes, that's correct. Uh, so we can open a fugitive investigation uh, related to unlawful flight to avoid prosecution, uh, which is what happened in this case once we got that request from Dallas PD. Once you got that request, what steps did you take? Uh, trying to go back through and uh, trace steps to locate where uh, where they may have flown to. So pretty quickly we were able to establish that they flew out of DFW into Seoul, South Korea, and then from there uh, took a flight from South Korea into Cambodia. Uh, the FBI does have folks that are stationed in various major cities throughout the world, so we were able to kind of work through some liaison contacts and requests for information from those other cities and agents to actually learn that they seemed to be like they were stationary in Cambodia. And uh, after that information, what, is, what did you do next? Uh, we kind of tried to, to leverage our, our fugitive investigation as best we could to develop where in Cambodia they may be. Obviously, doing that from the United States is not a particularly easy thing. Uh, so we relied heavily on the folks that were over in Cambodia, uh, basically found out bank accounts of, of relevance and said, hey, here's some, some information that we hope you all can use. Um, they were able to get video of uh, ATM withdrawals over in Cambodia and then ultimately identify uh, folks that knew where, where they were staying uh, and then effect an arrest over there. Okay. And at some point, um, you, you kind of turned that over to Kathleen Nichols as far as uh, being a person in Cambodia, a special agent assigned there and her task force as far yes. as location. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, after they were arrested in Cambodia, uh, how did they get back here to the United States? Flew over there and got them. So that was uh, a few months later. Uh, some other folks that were on the Violent Crimes Task Force and I went over in a uh, commercial flight to Cambodia, picked them up, and brought them back where they landed at DFW Airport and were transferred into DVD custody. Um, how was that flight back? It was long. It was a very uh, long flight. Just for the jury who doesn't know, when you are transporting um, a, a prisoner on that kind of flight, like where do you have to sit? Uh, it, to the extent that the airlines can help, uh, they will put us in the back of planes or somewhere that's not directly next to the general public. Uh, if you have a totally full flight, uh, usually we try to occupy single rows by ourselves. So. We've got our, our subjects in the middle of us in the event that we would need to take action of some kind. Uh, so in this particular instance, it was, they were generally full planes, uh, and we were kind of bookended on both subjects as we were escorting them back. And how many agents went to Cambodia? I think there were six of us total. Now, what was the process of getting them All right, at this time, I would like to offer uh, State 392, and this is a uh, some business records affidavit. Uh, I'm sorry, some business re records that have been on file with the business.
reference Prophet David uh, for more than 14 days, uh, generation of his counsel. No, Your Honor, I'm sorry. No objection, Your Honor. Case Exhibit 392 is admitted for all purposes. Permission of Helen Strong, you may. Kensington Drive in Mesquite, Texas. Was that the uh, address that you all were able to identify as uh, where Lisa Dykes and Charles Beltran lived? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And just looking at this, um, does it appear that Miss um, Dykes had just renewed her lease on 10-1 of 2020? It, it does say that that is the commencement date of this. Yes, ma'am. I, I don't recall ever having read that full lease, but that's what it, it looked like was stated on there. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, um, the date that Maricela went missing was just days later, is that correct? That's correct. Based on your investigation into uh, Ms. Dykes and, and Charles Beltran, was there any indication uh, prior to the murder of uh, Maricela Beltran that they intended on leaving the area? Uh, I'm sorry, that uh, Ms. Dykes and Mr. Beltran yes. intended to do. Uh, so we had information that they were in Arkansas for a uh, some sort of a concert, I believe it was. But as far as uh, travel beyond that, uh, nothing that we found was indicative of that, no ma'am. Okay, and, and visiting with uh, Ms. Dykes uh, employee, uh, fellow employees, um, did you learn that she had been employed there for quite some time? I don't recall her entire tenure, uh, but they did say that her leaving was very abrupt. Your Honor, pass the witness. Well, when you say that her leaving was very abrupt, uh, she had already told, you, and I'm looking at your report, but she had already told the owner over there that she was having issues uh, from her surgery. I did, I'm not sure what she told the owner. I was, uh, in, in saying that it was abrupt, I think there was one, in, at least one interview with a coworker uh, that was surprised by her leaving in the fashion that she did. Because the coworker don't know why she left, right? I, I'm not, not sure about that, so no, sir. Right? It, they could be, yes, sir. I, I'm not sure what other knowledge they may have had. Okay. Um, let me specifically ask you about the, um, I want to make sure I ask you I don't, I don't want to take up a lot of your, your time, but you guys talk to a lot of people, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't know about a lot, but there were definitely some, some folks that were uh, canvassed for and trying to get witness statements from, yes, sir. Okay, well, were you aware that after you went to Mitz Dyke's home uh, to try to talk to her, um, that her address suddenly appeared on social media? No, sir. And then they started getting uh, phone calls and uh, threatening messages? No, sir, I've not been made aware of that. If, but you're, if you're familiar with this case, you know that there was a lot of social media interest, wasn't it? There was definitely social media interest, yes, sir. And I think you indicated that y'all got in front of the ring camera because y'all wanted to make sure that she saw that y'all were uh, legit with a mesquite police. Yes, uh, yes, sir. I apologize for interrupting. Uh, yes, uh, like I said, if we're especially if we're making phone calls to folks and there's a situation where we can't readily show our credentials, we want to make sure that whoever we're talking to uh, again knows that it's actually the FBI that's there and not some sort of a, a phone scam. Well, did you show her your, your I don't recall showing my credentials. I think I identified myself on the phone and I said, hey, we've got a uniformed officer that's here with us. Yes, sir. Um, and 
and, 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 and I just want to make sure I'm clear on this, uh, at this Reno location where one of your, was that one of your officers that made contact with someone, with a patron, that believed that they saw someone that fit uh, Morello's? Ms. Batello's? Yes, yes, that was one of our task force officers that went there, found someone that said that they thought they saw someone on the night of the 5th that fit uh, Ms. Batello's description, yes, sir. Okay, and, and, and I understand that you said that, well, that description could have fit, could have fit uh, several people, right? Yes, sir. But more importantly, the description that they gave fit her description, correct? With the exception of not having on the, uh, the purple dress, uh, yes. I mean, that was the day after. Uh, I think the, yeah, within the 24 hours, yes, sir. I mean, she's seen with Charles Beltran at the 7 Eleven during the early morning hours, right? Yes, sir. But they left that area, right? Yes. So is it possible she came back in a different outfit? I, I don't know what would have been possible but at that point. Uh, my recollection of viewing that video. We could not make out if it was Ms. Beltran on that, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Patello on that video. But you couldn't say for sure you what? No, it was not of good enough quality, no, sir. And, I mean, just lastly on that subject, I mean, the, the, the patron was certain enough that you guys took the time to go and find that video, didn't you? Uh, I think it's worth following up on, especially uh, at that stage of the investigation uh, where we were because again, you never know what's going to help you guys find these missing people. That's correct, yes sir. That's why when, when, when people call in, if they say they see someone, it's important that we follow, that y'all follow up, correct? I would caveat that with saying with respect to other information that's known during the course of an investigation, yes sir, because there are times when you can get tips uh, that may be completely irrelevant based on other case knowledge that you have. Okay. But if shortly after she's alleged to have gone missing, a security guard is shown a photo of Ms. Patella, says, yeah, I saw her, that's something we want to follow up on. Would you agree? I'm not sure if it was a security guard that he spoke to, but if someone says that they saw her in the early stage of, the, of an investigation, yes, you'd want to follow up on that. Would mean that October of 2020 is still the early stages of this investigation, right? Yes, sir. And if, if, if they go to not one but two different locations showing this photo, and those people say, we believe we saw her over near the city inn, over near the Mustang inn, that's something you're going to want to follow up on, isn't it? Uh, again, uh, if I'm the, the lead investigator on that, I would probably want to have some folks go out there and take a look at those spots. Yes, sir. And are you sure that they never got the patron's name that said that he saw someone that fit her description? I do not know. I was not the one that spoke with uh, that patron of that bar. And um, and just so so members of the jury clear, uh, if you're a person of interest, you don't have to cooperate with law enforcement, do you? No, you don't. No, sir. If you want to go to Mexico, you can go to Mexico, right? Uh, yes, sir. Assuming you've got the uh, correct paperwork to do so. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I'm just saying. If you're a person of interest, you don't have to cooperate. Right? No, sir. In fact, even after you're arrested with an arrest warrant, you don't have to cooperate, do you? That's correct, sir. And when y'all went out to the Wilmot area initially, did you, did I hear you correctly saying that the, the did you were a part of that initial search? Yes, sir. And y'all didn't find anything at that time, right? No, sir. Okay. Um, had you found anything that you felt 
was connected to this disappearance, y'all would have noted that. I, I would certainly hope so, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir. Can you redirect? No, Your Honor. May this witness be fine next to you? No objection from the state. Thank you. You're free to leave and go back to your business. Thank you, ma'am. Call your next witness. The state calls Vanessa Pozos. Solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, can you uh, state your name and spell your name for the court for us? Yeah. Vanessa Pozos, V A N E S S A P O Z O S. Are you nervous? Yeah. Okay. Uh, take a deep breath, relax. Um, uh, let's just talk about. Um, how do you know Maricela Vitello? Dear friend of mine, um, we met when we worked together at the store that she was an assistant manager in, and I was hired through um, the pandemic, and we just met. We just grew as great friends. Okay, and so uh, what store was this that you all worked at? Charlotte Roos. Uh, what kinds of, uh, uh, I guess, responsibilities did you have at Charlotte Roos? Stocking the merchandise, making sure the store was, you know, presentable for our customers. Um, it was kind of like shortly after the pandemic, so we were just kind of like opening up with some restrictions, like closed, like closed off fitting rooms, and you know, just talking to the customers and seeing what we can help them with if they were shopping for something particular. We would just talk to our customers and help them out in any sort of way. Okay, and this was in Seattle. Yes. Uh, is it actually in Seattle or a little town up right outside of Seattle? It's called Tequila. It's a well-known mall called South Center. Yeah. And um, how long did you all work there today? Well, I was hired in January of 2020 and um, up to the date, up to like the last day that she flew out. The last day she flew out. So she flew out on October 2nd, 2020? Yes. Yeah, uh, and we worked the day before. Yeah, we were working together, and we were just talking, and she basically just said her goodbyes, you know, before she was gonna go home and pack. Okay. And uh, was she? She was an assistant manager, is that correct? Yes. What was your position? Um, sales representative. Okay. So just like right below her. <laughs> and just right below. Her. She yeah. Was your, she was your supervisor. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, did she start out as an assistant manager, or was that something she promoted to? It was something that she was already, you know, positioned at when I joined the team, so okay. I'm not okay. sure, to be honest. Okay. Um, as far as Maricela is concerned, did you all spend a lot of uh, time together between January and October? Oh, most definitely. And did you get to know her family? Um, I met her family briefly on the times that we did go to her apartment, but I mostly just picked her up like outside of her apartment, just texted her, hey, I'm outside, you know, just picking her up like when we would hang out. Um, I do remember hearing her parents talk one of the nights that we did come home a little late, 
about like 9 or 10 p.m. is considered late, and yeah, and, but mostly everybody was already asleep, so we okay. just stayed quiet. Okay, so you just kind of briefly met them, but um, what kind of household, you, you went into our apartment, uh, what kind of household was it? Well, the Hispanic household is very clean, organized, quiet, um, very respectful, very respectful. Um, you know, you're going to show up at, you have an, um, I'm sorry, you have like a, what is it called, a curfew, you know, that you have to get home to, and just very respectful family. What types of things uh, socially would you and Mary Kelly do? Just hang out. Um, well, I was 21 at the time, and she was 23 at the time. Oh, wait, 20, 20, 22. I was 22, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I was 22 at the time, so we would just casually go to a Alki Beach. Um, it's like a really common beach in Seattle. It's a close body of water. Um, there's scooters there. Um, sunsets are beautiful to catch whenever you're there. It's a very touristy beach. Um, that was like mostly our hangout spot. Um, there's bonfires that go on during the summer. Um, but what we would do socially is literally just bring my Bluetooth speaker, drive around cruising is the word, you know, just hang out, just stay away from people because, you know, it was like kind of like after, shortly after the pandemic. So it was just me and her most of the time. We didn't really have like a big 